my panel is called Where Are the Women? Marginalised um, Women's Voices in the Media. And today I'm going to be joined by Anna Lowe, uh, MBE, a former Alliance Party politician. Anna was born in Hong Kong and came to live in Northern Ireland in 1974. So she's been a Belfast woman for longer than I have. Um, we know that Anna has had a, a long uh, career. She knows a, a few things about being the first uh, woman uh, to, to, to be elected from her community. Um, and we're, we're delighted to have such uh, expertise uh, today. Uh, next we're joined, I'm going alphabetically, so no, no favoritism, we're going with Elspeth Fisher, is a freelance filmmaker from South Belfast. And Elspeth um, is also a member of the LGBT community and she is making a feature length documentary at the moment uh, as part of her creative practice PhD at Queen's University Belfast. And that's uh, let us be seen analyzing and documenting the development of grassroots feminism in Belfast. So I'm sure we'll be watching uh, out for, the, for the, the data and the information that flows from that. Uh, next, we have uh, the force of nature that is uh, Lillian Senoy Barr, uh, a woman I have great admiration for. I've got to know over the last year or so. Uh, she's, a, she's a great woman to have on your side. Uh, she's a dairy girl. Proud Maasai woman. She has over 20 years experience in working in the community sector and is the director of the Northwest Migrants Forum doing incredible work uh, up in the Northwest to highlight the issues that are there and issues around the border long before Brexit uh, uh, was, was an issue for us all. Next up we have uh, Rachel Powell who is the women's sector lobbyist with the uh, Women's Resource and Development Agency and she's the chair of the Women's Policy Group NI. Uh, she's also a disabled woman and a rural woman from uh, Katie and County Armagh. And last but by no means least, um, I'm really delighted to be joined today by Stacey Graham who is from the Woodvale uh, area of Belfast. She is a loyalist activist, a feminist, a mother, a uh, progressive unionist party equality officer and she's working in the community for the Greater Shankill uh, Alternatives Group. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to allow uh, the women to introduce themselves a little bit more and just have some opening remarks. Um, so now that we've gone alphabetically that way, we'll start with you, Stacey, going back around the other way. So if you want to go ahead, thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, well, as Amanda said, I um, live and work in the Greater Shankill area. Um, I have been involved in community work probably since I was around 12 or 13 coming from a, a strong family of female loyalists um, who had recognised there was a lot of stuff happening in the area around the loyalist feuds um, and recognising that, that we need to take the kids out of this area and sort of look at diversionaries um, rather than criminalising the young people. Um, so I got sort of stuck in with Emmons from when I was 12 and 13 doing street parties, doing cultural awareness sessions um, and was then lucky enough to fall into Shankill Alternatives um, from I was about 14, we were involved in different trips to Berlin where we were looking at similarities around peace walls, looking at the relationship with young people in the police um, and sort of looking at what we can take away um, from each other and looking at what, um, we, what, what unites us and what we can see that unites us um, rather than looking at our differences. Um, so from when I was about 15, getting involved in everything and anything. And as Amanda said, I'm a proud loyalist. Um, I'm delighted that Rangers won yesterday, absolutely over the moon. <laughs> and Lucy is a Celtic fan, I'm going to be gracious here and say well done. <laughs> but um, no, yeah, just being involved in community work, wanting to make change from a really, really young age. Great, Stacey, thank you very much. And uh, next, if we could go to Rachel, please. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so happy International Women's Day, everyone. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of this event today with uh, so many incredible women on this panel. Um, and for me personally, you know, I'm the women's sector lobbyist and I'm always talking all things gender, but disability is something that is incredibly personal to me. And uh, it is quite a rare thing, I think, to be talking specifically about disability and gender. So I'm really thankful to have this opportunity. For me, um, I became disabled at 11 years old, um, got diagnosed with a number of genetic chronic conditions that have worsened significantly since then. and was also a carer from a, a really young age for my two disabled parents. So it's something that has been very much a part of my life from when I was young and has, and has definitely shaped my identity um, a strong bit. So I'm really happy to get to talk about that side of things today more generally and particularly just trying to shine a light on how disabled women are some of the most marginalized in our society, but so rarely have a voice and Crucially, when disability is discussed in the media, it tends to be in the context in Northern Ireland anyway, 
of uh, trying to ban abortion on the grounds of disability, yet the same groups that do this uh, introduce policies that actively harm disabled people. So in the disability community, it can be quite frustrating because we have diverse views on the topic, but we only ever see disability being used as a scapegoat rather than actually amplifying our voice. The other way we, we tend to see it is in the context of talking about benefit scroungers <laughs> and you know being a burden on society. And, and something that has really frustrated me over the last year is someone who was you know clinically extremely vulnerable in shielding was the outright eugenics happening, you know, lock away disabled people, keep them at home, we should go back to normal. And I think just people have no understanding of how much that impacts disabled people. And like every one of us knows a disabled person, either our friends or our family. Um, so like even just for context, a few stats, 23% of people in the UK are disabled, or 20, sorry, 14 million people are disabled and 23% of those are women. Um, so it's not like there aren't many of us around, but you would think looking in the media that we didn't exist. So delighted to have this opportunity today to be able to talk about you know, some of the experiences I've had with the media on this and to try and amplify some of the issues that, that really, you know, we could do with the media backing us on and, and trying to shine a light on them. So thank you so much, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. And next, uh, Lillian, if you just want to uh, give us your opening remarks, please. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, Amanda. Let me start by saying how happy I am to be here today. It's a wonderful day, International Women's Day. And looking at the media, a black woman has taken over today. So I'm really pleased that everything that is being spoken about today is racism and black women and, uh, and their assertiveness. So, so that is not what is being shown, but it is being exposed out there. I started my work um, when I was 16 years old in, in Kenya when I realized that I was the only Maasai girl in a boarding school. Uh, that uh, had girls, uh, an all girls boarding school, but I seemed to be the only Maasai girls at that time. And I think that it was my uh, first encounter of patriarchy within my community of the Maasai people. And um, that's where my activism started. I started working, um, uh, empowering the Maasai girl child to fight for their own rights and their own space. I come from a very lucky family where my parents, my dad is educated, but my mom never got that education that she really wanted to, but she has been my inspiration because she made sure that all her girls in her family were educated and had a better life than what, what she had. So I've been, uh, I would say a feminist without knowing for a very long time. And it was just automatic for me. And when I came to Northern Ireland, I realized that it is also the minority ethnic women who are left behind in all aspects of public life. It's not only in the media, but obviously the media has so much influence in reinforcing that stereotype or prejudice against minority ethnic people. Then I found myself doing activism again in Northern Ireland to uh, raise awareness of the issues that impact on marginalized communities. And I'm really delighted to have a platform right now here to be able to continue doing that. And thank you so much for your opportunity. Thank you, Lillian. And next we'll move to Elspeth. Elspeth, if you want to go ahead. Hi, yeah, thank you, Amanda. And yeah, I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of the panel. Um, as was said, I'm a, a filmmaker and a creative uh, from Belfast originally. And since moving back over the last few years, I've been really humbled to work with so many other great feminists and creatives in, in the work that I do through conducting interviews and, and filmmaking. And yeah, it's made me really passionate to try and tell those stories that are so often overlooked. I think particularly visibility for queer women is still something that in the mainstream media is often um, not represented. And especially for women, uh, those stories are still very much not a part of what we see day to day. So hopefully through visual cultures such as films, I'm hoping to try and redress that imbalance and showcase some wonderful women that we have locally. So yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you, Elspeth. Uh, and Anna? Right. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, happy International Women's Day. And thank you for inviting me. And uh, what a wonderful panel of, of members. So uh, yes, a funny thing, I know when you were talking about growing up, I suddenly thought about, I actually, um, 
I experienced discrimination from my own family in Hong Kong. I, I was quite bright in school, I should say, perhaps, with three older brothers um, who, you know, and then at school I did as well as all my other brothers. But then at 16, 17, after O levels, then my parents just say, no, you're a girl. Um, you're not going to go to university. Your older brothers certainly must have priorities over you and we're spending money, uh, you know, putting them through university. So you have to go out to work and uh, to earn a living to help to educate your brothers. I obviously, at that age, you just would do what your parents, you know, tell you to do. Um, but I was very angry. I was very angry. I wanted to be like my brothers, to become architects, accountants, and engineers, whatever. And uh, I think it set me up from then of really wanting to work for the underdog, to want to really see that equality for everyone. So I had a very varied career. I started up as a secretary and then came to Northern Ireland, um, worked in the BBC. And then when the children were young, I um, worked. Uh, I became a part-time interpreter. And then seeing the needs or unmet needs in the Chinese community, then I went to uh, University of Arista to become, uh, to qualify as a social worker. And um, then work as a social worker, work as a community um, uh, worker really so and then uh, and then became the director of the Chinese Welfare Association and we also uh, worked with groups other groups to to try to extend the racial equality order the race relation order to Northern Ireland from England and um, then I got elected in 2007 as you said to be uh, the MOA for South Belfast uh, but certainly enjoyed my different careers and hopefully you know try to to raise the voice of ethnic minority people. Thank you Anna I'd say you, you, you've very much done that over the years just, just to touch on, on something you were saying about where you know whenever you were first nominated um, to, to the Alliance Party you faced a little bit of pushback from people saying, you know, how can, how can Anilo represent the, the people of South Belfast, even though you had been living there for, for longer than many of them had been alive? What was that like? Yeah, it was quite strange, you know, when, when yeah, people wrote in and even phoned the Alliance Party and kind of said, how dare her, you know, uh, stand for, for Northern Ireland, uh, for South Belfast. She's not from here. Uh, and, and as you said, you know, I'd come here much longer or lived in Northern Ireland much longer than a lot of the younger candidates, you know, who would only be in their 20s when I was already in my 50s. So I counted myself very much as a local. Um, if anything else, you know, I felt that I had that extra perspective from coming from outside and with no axe to grind for either. Uh, side of, of our divided society, you know. So, uh, no, I, well, it was hot, hurtful in some ways, but um, you just have to ride over above it. And you had said, you know, that the, the race relations order in 1997 that, that outlawed discrimination on racial grounds, that that was one of the things that started to make a difference in Northern Ireland? Very much so, very much so. Um, and, you know, we're now talking, you know, for this conference about media, during the troubles, the decades of the troubles, because I suppose of, of the difficulties we all face, the media absolutely ignored ethnic minority people. Um, we were totally out of the radar of the media. And, you know, I would be asked occasionally to go up to talk about the Chinese New Year. And uh, I remember on one occasion, I was asked to uh, go up to the BB one of the BBC morning programs and um, you know, talk about the Chinese New Year. And I had two young children at the time and I had to find someone to look after the, the two children and to go to the broadcasting house. 
So I talk about the traditions and then the presenter asked me, oh, what, you know, what's the significance of the, of this year, you know, year or whatever it was. And I kind of say, well, this is what some people believe, blah, blah. And they made some jokes about it, which really annoyed me. I felt hurt. And then the next year when they asked me again to come up to do the same thing again, I said, no, I'm not coming. Uh, he made frivolous jokes about it and I, you know, I felt very hurt. And then the producer then came and asked me and said, why are you saying that? I said, well, this is what happened. And uh, so I said, um, he said, right, fine, good, we we'll, we'll like you. What would you like to talk about? I said, you know, there are a lot of issues for the Chinese community that I would like to talk about, not about Chinese New Year, you know, once a year. So yeah, well, I went up and I talk about the needs of the Chinese community, the lack of information for this community, minority community and lack of access to services. And afterwards, the producer congratulated me and said, that's exactly what we want to hear. That's you know, excellent. So yeah, I think the media certainly need to be more tuned in. For example, like, you know, the pandemic in, I, I think nationally, um, we are better now, particularly after the um, uh, after the George Floyd uh, Black, Black Lives Matter. Though we are getting more diverse, but not locally, not in the local media. You know, would the would the pandemic have do you seen anybody interviewed here in Northern Ireland about how ethnic minority people cope with the pandemic? They certainly have. They're, yeah, they have the general problems like we all have, you know, the local people all have, but they have separate issues that, you know, you don't know about and I don't know about unless you talk to them, unless they have a voice, you know, in terms of more isolation, lack of family support, lack of social support, you know, so, but no, nobody ever and, you know, nobody has gone to ask them. So I think that's the lack of consciousness about being inclusive, about, you know, about you know, respecting diversity or, or, you know, being conscious about diversity in Northern Ireland. And, and, uh, and I'm very sorry, Amanda. Go ahead, Sophia. Um, and just agreeing with what Anna said, um, judging on my own experience, we had started up um, a community response in the Woodfield area and had done a leaflet, um, 2,000 leaflets went around every single door in the Woodfield and we had got a lot of ethnic minorities actually coming back to us. Um, Good. One in particular, there was a Romanian family, um, they were newcomers, they were relatively new into Northern Ireland. Um, there was a serious language barrier, so yeah. rather than be on the phone, it was WhatsApp, it was translate, things like that. But the, the appreciation that that young family really, really had, saying we would never have had any help, we have no money. My partner works in the car wash, which has been closed down, we're not entitled to any benefits. Um, and only that we were going door to door, they'd be sitting there and would have absolutely nothing. Sure, sure. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, and thank you. It's yeah. been very encouraging to, to see how communities have, have pulled together and um, something that you highlighted uh, there, Anna, about what you're asked to speak on. I know, Lillian, that you've had a similar issue where perhaps um, you know, you're know you frustrated that whenever you're contacted by the media, it tends to be about racism or hate crime and not about what you think of the economy, what you know, care and responsibilities, the constitutional position, anything at all out with what um, would seem like sort of very narrow topic areas. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you for asking me that question because I think that is actually the real problem when it comes to the media. Minority ethnic people are put in one box. And uh, also in society uh, at large, when people come here, the only skill we seem to have brought in this country is about culture and it's about racism. There's nothing else that we can be able to talk about. And we, we don't have the same political beliefs or backgrounds within our community, which means we'll get different perspectives on different social issues. But this is the only thing that is recognized. And, I, and, and it is very frustrating. I work with, a, a very wide range of minority ethnic people and all of them when they came to this country. Some of the women who I work with told me, I started going to YouTube to learn how to make bracelets so that I can make a living. I have never done that. I'm an engineer. 
I'm a professor, I'm a lawyer, you know, but when they come to Northern Ireland, somehow this is the only thing that you can do, or somehow you have absolutely nothing and you need saviors to come and save you in Northern Ireland so that you can start alive. And that is where the media um, really do have a role to play because if, if, if your newsroom does not reflect, reflect the diversity of society, you miss the stories that you are supposed to be telling about communities. If the images of black people that our young people see is the images of um, negative people or people who are uh, of maybe in gangs or people who are dangerous or people who have committed crimes, but they don't see a, a very successful lawyer or a very successful engineer or a very successful surgeon who they have overpopulated these hospitals that we all go to. What do you expect the younger generation in this country to think of the black community or the Chinese community if there's nothing positive that we talk about? So having that imbalance in society or the reflection of the people that we have within the society is not reflected positively or a fair balanced story in the media, it reinforces that stereotype and racial bias towards minority ethnic people. And I just wish that the media can start learning. And I, I, I think Anna Law said that things are changing. I actually don't see things changing. I still see uh, racial bias being reinforced. Every time I received a call from the media, it's not about Brexit, which impact on our society really negatively. It's not about the impact of COVID-19 on minority ethnic people. The calls I receive is about the disproportionate um, for COVID fines that minority ethnic people have received, which is very important to highlight that because that is systemic racism in this system. But that's not only what we can talk about. We can talk about education because we have our children in schools. We can talk about the health because we have our people also who live in this country who are impacted really uh, with, the, with the pandemic. We can also talk about the economy. We have my, a lot of minority ethnic people who are successful business people who are also suffering right now through the, the, the pandemic. There's so much that we can give to this society. And if this knowledge is not tapped into, it is Northern Ireland's loss because people are going to be fed up and they will leave. And I'll tell you, a lot of people have asked us to leave if we cannot succeed here. The reality is Northern Ireland will not succeed without diversity. We need diversity in Northern Ireland to get beyond the troubles of Northern Ireland, to get beyond the two tradition mentality of Northern Ireland so that Northern Ireland can finally become a global nation. Thank you, Lillian. Um, you, you came to prominence quite a bit over the last year regarding the, the Black Lives uh, Matter protests and the, the way that they were handled by the police and so on. And there was a lot of uh, press interest um, at, at the time over that. You have spoken to me previously about how, um, you know, that was handled, uh, you know, to a certain extent as if it was a, a, a crime issue um, and that you have concerns about how it reinforces sort of right wing kind of negative stereotypes. Yeah, I think uh, it's no secret that Black Lives Matter and COVID-19 has right gotten that spotlight on racial injustice within the society that we live in. I think most of us, and um, I'm speaking in front of a giant here because Anna Lowe would know everything that I am talking about right now. Most of us had the suspicion before of systemic racism in Northern Ireland, but it was very hard to articulate because you are faced by denial, you are faced by defensiveness, and you're faced by excuses, even from allies who you would think that they will reflect on it and think about what actually does this person means when they talk about systemic racism in Northern Ireland. And you are also faced by the unresolved issues of Northern Ireland, which is being used as an excuse to bury systemic racism in Northern Ireland. And um, it, is, it is very clear to me in my mind that the racist attacks that our community, we get through the streets, the fact that they are never resolved, it is because of systemic racism. And that is reinforcing it, it is justifying it, and it is actually enabling it even more. 
Because if, if, if the people who are working within the system are racially biased to themselves, there is no way these issues can be resolved. So we can pretend that we have a small majority of people within the streets of Northern Ireland that are racist and we all don't like them and the whole population is against them, but we have to be honest and start grappling with systemic racism that is within our own community. And then we don't have to go far away than thinking about somebody like Gregory Campbell, who is a decision maker in Northern Ireland, who is also somebody who we should be depending on as a minority ethnic person to develop policies that will support our community. Lillian, I'm sure um, you know most people are aware of, of that scenario, but just for a, a refresher, there was a bit of a controversy uh, not that long ago around the, the lineup for the BBC programme Songs of Praise, um, and uh, there were some issues around commentary that uh, Gregory Campbell, the DUP MP, had made um, on that matter, and you challenged Gregory and you spoke to the DUP about that, and I know that you sort of felt that um, there was a, a reasonably positive conclusion to those discussions, I think uh, the fact that he agreed to meet, that was good with the stories I've heard about him. He never really listens to anybody else. He only believes in his views, but we, we did meet. We had a, a really good meeting, uh, I have to say, because he did listen. If he had us, it's a different thing, uh, but he did listen to all our views. And that is why I came out with a statement to say that I believe that he does not recognize racism. He is somebody who has only one view of the community and he's not grappling even with the impact of his own words towards a community that he's supposed to be representing. And if you look at his history, the so-called anti-racist has absolutely no idea what to be an anti-racist is. And, um, but the positive for me out of that meeting is that the fact that he met with us, he's now able to understand that we are not bystanders and we are not going to watch regardless of who you are within this community. I wanted to bring Elspeth in, in next. Elspeth, just as you go to take a drink, I'm gonna <laughs> start talking. Um, just something that Lillian has mentioned to me in the past is about how um, that uh, people from ethnic minorities are part of the community they're not an addition to it that they're part of it and that they should be treated as such and I know that um, as a young woman you describe yourself as a young queer woman a young woman from the LGBT community that sometimes um, the, all, all of the various voices from the LGBT community perhaps don't get the airing that they should do um, and there's a tendency as much as I adore uh, all of the men from the LGBT community that when people think you know gay issues they think of just talking to gay men and they don't necessarily think to talk to lesbian women or bisexual women or, or trans women for that matter either. Um, you have said to me that you have had to sort of combat you know, sexism working um, as a director and that you have become involved in LGBT heritage pro programs uh, with like-minded volunteers to try and amplify those voices as well. So I'm just wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about that experience. Yes, absolutely. Um, yes, I think as, as you were saying, Amanda, um, it can tend to be what gets a higher profile can be issues um, led by gay men, just I suppose as in the same logic of, of being in a patriarchy, those can be the broader issues in the, ma in the mainstream press anyway. Um, but I would say on the flip side of that, there are many allies and there are a lot of great positive incentives um, coming from LGBT women. And there certainly aren't the grassroots in Belfast, which is something I find very inspiring to be a part of. And um, yeah, for, with Ruth McCarthy and the likes of Outburst, uh, there's trying to redress that imbalance, working with uh, local queer musicians. Uh, she developed uh, the new lesbian songbook, which came out this year, which was an illustrated magazine and a series of performances uh, with local artists. So yeah, I try to um, stay involved with a lot of incentives like that. And uh, the 343 is another great example. They're totally uh, grassroots and self-funded space at East Belfast in that community on the Upper Newton Arts Road. And um, they put on events and they try and just introduce drag and various uh, queer art forms into the community to make everybody aware that it's family friendly, 
that there's so many different sides to queer culture and it's not just about being one thing because I think as our other panelists have been saying it's it's all too often the case that you just have to become a spokesperson on one thing and I know even from a particularly from trans women I've I've worked with it's very exhausting to have to always be a spokesperson for your community and to only ever talk about that and in fact it can be quite re-traumatizing for people who've obviously undergone a big emotional journey with their gender identity to then always just have to be talking about that when they may be a musician they may have many other things to say and to offer well, so could you talk a little bit about the, the emotional labor of that of you know expecting expecting people to be that political voice and how exhausting that can be yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's the thing. It's just if you're if you're only ever seen as that one thing, it should be the case that we have all types of voices, and uh, therefore it's not seen as you are this, you're in this box due to however you identify. So I think um, if there were more varieties of yeah LGBT women, I think in mainstream media, we wouldn't then have to just zone in on the fact that that's what they were and constantly make them talk about it because as we know, they're just people offering many amazing things. And, and more younger women as well, I'm sure. Stacey, can I just pick up something there with you? Because you have spoken before about that. You have had a, you know, a really sort of high profile in, in the last year or so, but you are, are become, you're near a burnout stage because people are constantly contacting you as if you're the only loyalist woman uh, that's able to speak. And that's obviously, you know, they're very impressed uh, by, uh, you know, how, how articulate you are and how you're representing the views of loyalist women. But you would quite like to be bringing through other loyalist women so that uh, people aren't coming to you all the time. Yes, I mean, um, there are millions of amazing loyalist women doing really, really fantastic work in their communities day and daily. I just don't think they have the confidence or the self the self esteem to put themselves forward, or they're they're frightened of what uh, may happen when they do. Um, I mean, even I had spoke out at the Ulster Hall um, around the the Brexit issue, and and nothing in my speech was even remotely sectarian. It was more of a feminist speech talking about strong loyalist women and the abuse that I received was absolutely horrific and it really really takes its toll on you and I think when other people see that they're more reluctant to sort of come forward but in working class communities I mean they have really really low capacity already to sort of speak out or speak for themselves um, they don't feel like unionist politicians are speaking for them um, but when you look at sort of republicanism or Sinn Féin Sinn Féin, they're born out of community activists. They were living and working in the community and then became politicians, where most of our unionist politicians are career politicians and then have to make those relationships in the community. So lawyers, people don't feel like they're being represented properly. Okay. And what's your experience been like, you know, of the media? Because obviously there's been very peri various periods and topics over the last uh, number of years that um, have sort of put the, the loyalist community into the spotlight you've had some sort of um not necessarily bad experiences but perhaps maybe people stereotyping you a little bit um yes um at one stage and whenever we were talking around the protocol um i was asked to do an interview and just before the interview happened um sort of we bit of small talk between me and the reporter and the reporter went well hello stacy are you a rangers fan and I was like, are you assuming just because I'm a loyalist, I'm a Rangers fan? But yes, I am a massive Rangers fan. But it's just sort of challenging those stereotypes. And people always perceive loyalists to be these big bad men who are lurking in the corners and doing all these bad things. But there's criminality everywhere. Um, we need to highlight, the, and everybody here has touched on it, we need to highlight the good news stories that are happening in loyalist stories and the good news stories that are happening in Northern Ireland as a whole, I think. And you've spoken a little bit about there being a reluctance uh, among some within loyalism to engage with the media because they feel as if their, um, you know, their words are going to be twisted or that they're being targeted or that you know they're always sort of on the back foot. Is that is that sort of a, a widespread feeling that you get amongst people that they don't want to engage? Because I know sometimes you know I, I sometimes feel like a protest correspondent. I've been at every protest going trying to cover the stories and it, it's difficult as a reporter when you uh, you know someone's there to protest something and you say okay why are you here let you know let me share why you're here and and there's there's reluctance or there can be a little bit of people suggesting you know outside influences suggesting oh you know don't talk yeah yeah I mean 
I think with with me especially, I think community leaders in, in, in Shankill anyway have sort of promoted and are realising now that we need to have those relationships with the media to get our stories across. For a long time, I think I think unionism as a whole is always feeling like they're having to defend something. Sorry, my phone. Sorry, unionism as a whole um, is always having to defend and sort of protect what they have and protect their identity and sort of anybody coming in and poking in, they, they see it as a threat. But I think slowly people are realising we need to engage with the media, get our voice out there and be heard. Okay, thank you very much. Stacey, we'll, we'll get back to you in a second. I just talk to you for, for, for a little bit. Rachel, could you uh, talk to me a little bit about all of those issues that you're saying that the media don't talk to you about, you know, the welfare reform, austerity, um, you know, and the intersectionality of all this. You know, you've mentioned abortion and you've also, you highlighted something I hadn't heard of before, pure inspiration porn, if you want to talk to us a little bit about what that is. Yeah, uh, inspiration porn is like my biggest peeve uh, when it comes to media representation of disabled people. And there's a few different reasons why this bothers me. And it's the idea that when a, when a disabled person does well at something, it, you know, let's showcase this, like what an inspiring person doing this in spite of your disabilities. And I am just sick of this narrative because you know it happened to me actually a few years ago. Um, I, I graduated, taught my class, my master's, and, and they wanted to do a, a report on it. And it was like, despite her disabilities, Rachel has achieved this. And I had to call them out. And I was like, no, I'm not having a, an article going out like this because it's not in spite of my disabilities. It's in spite of the barriers that your institution has faced. So stop blaming me and my disabilities for being able to do something well and actually humanize us and talk to us about what the, the barriers are and try and address them. And it's something you see all the time. You see it, you see it with disabled people. You also see it as well with working class people where, um, like I'm a working class woman too. And they say, you know, working class hero, but a working class hero is only ever someone who manages to not be working class anymore or earn enough wealth that they're not working class. So I really want to challenge this inspiration porn. Um, it's a big pet peeve of mine and it's incredibly frustrating. And, and the language around it is really important because through that, we, we tend to take the identity of disability away from people. And people always say, you know, people with disabilities instead of disabled people, because there's so much stigma around the world word disabled and language is important. Like we don't say women with LGBT identity or women from rural areas. You say LGBT women, you say rural women. Why can we not say disabled women? And it's because there's such a sense of discomfort around the word disability. There's so much stigma around it. And in saying people with disabilities, we're actually refusing to acknowledge that it's society that creates these barriers, not the disabilities themselves. So let people have ownership over their disability and their identity as disabled people. And just, I wanted to touch on a few things around uh, like media representation on this because I relate so much to what the other women have said on this panel. And so the inspiration point is one side of it, but the the whole, um, you know, benefit scroungers debate really frustrates me because I spent quite a few years when my disabilities were at their worst, um, really trying to shine a light on how some of these government decisions were really harming disabled women, particularly around welfare reform. And I remember doing quite a bit of media on it at the time and, and was on a few different TV shows about it and did some articles and interviews. And some of the experiences I had are rage inducing. Um, so for one, uh, there was a debate around when welfare reform was coming in and you know targeting benefit fraud and and should we focus at, at tax evasion instead and i had a, a prominent politician scream at me on tv that i was a, a scrounger and a drain on society and i was just sitting there like you haven't listened to anything i've just said and made these horrific remarks to me you know this is my everyday lived experience and you're talking to me like this um and, and like some of the more annoying examples as well i was doing a, an interview before as well with a newspaper about invisible illnesses and it was to raise awareness around invisible disabilities because you look at me and usually you wouldn't know I'm disabled you wouldn't know that I have a, an immune disease and you wouldn't know I have a chronic bone disease but I wanted to talk about you know invisible illnesses in young people in particular because when I park with my blue badge I get so much abuse from people screaming at me what are you doing parking there you're a disgrace but then whenever I have in the past needed to use a walking stick or a wheelchair, it's like a different type of um, aggression towards me again, because I, I look physically disabled. But anyway, I've tried to do interviews about invisible illnesses and, and, you know, not all disabilities are visible. And I've had photographers and journalists show up at my house and say, oh, can we rent you a wheelchair or something so you look disabled? 
can you stand in the corner there like leaning against the wall holding a walking stick so you look disabled and I'm just sitting there like have you read what this interview is supposed to be about it's incredibly frustrating and what I wanted to talk about instead was like the inhumane process of changing from DLA to PIP and how they decided to give people points out of 12 on how disabled they were and how women were losing their disability support if they were on contraception because if you were able to have sex you couldn't be disabled you know these are issues I wanted to talk about around very real discrimination happening to disabled people and instead I was being told can we put you in a wheelchair you don't really look that disabled can we make you look disabled and it's just so dehumanizing it really is and it's so frustrating because there's so many issues and even things like marriage equality I'm a big advocate for LGBT rights, but disabled women still don't have uh, marriage equality. If you get married and you're disabled, you lose a significant amount of your social security support and lose your independence. And that is extremely problematic because disabled women are twice as likely to be victims of domestic abuse and twice as likely to be victims of financial abuse. So these are just some of the areas that I think should be getting media attention instead of whether I look disabled or if I I'm an inspiration for succeeding despite my disabilities. I just want to call that sort of crap out. Thank you for doing that, Rachel. It's disappointing to hear that, that, that you're having uh, some, some of those experiences. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit about, uh, Stacey had touched on a little bit about the abuse that you can face whenever you do step forward and, and engage in the media. Is that mainly online stuff? Is that where it tends to, to come from? And how do you handle that? Oh God, yeah, I'm very familiar with online abuse. Um, I got added to a load of lists on Twitter um, of these like far right men's rights activists. And every time I tweeted anything, I could tweet, it's a lovely day today. And they'd be like, you should die. <laughs> or, you know, send death threats or rape threats or horrific abuse to me. And when that's at its worst actually is when I talk about abortion as well. Particularly whenever I talk about abortion and disability. Um, because I talk about issues how for disabled women there's so many extra barriers to actually getting an abortion and we're still autonomous beings and we should have autonomy over our own bodies but often disabled women don't and I try to talk about how you know setting limits gestational limits disproportionately impact marginalized women um, and that you know a tiny group of people need access to abortion after these dates but the ones that do tend to be the most marginalized and it tends to be migrant women rural women disabled women single parents and so on and when I try to talk about that, I get messages, like really horrific messages, like if you're so vulnerable, you should be banned from having sex and the government should be checking in to make sure. And if you if you have an abortion, you should be sent to jail because you knew the risks, you know, all these horrific things that like what in what world is that a normal thing to say to someone? Um, but in general, sure, in any political views, I tend to get a lot of abuse and it's really stopped me from ever wanting to express a political opinion. And that's a challenging thing to do because I'm a women's sector lobbyist. I have to challenge politicians. It's a part of my daily job. So the one thing I think to help cope with that, I have so many incredible strong women that I work with um, who have unfortunately faced similar abuse. It, it's something that has been normalized for us. So instead, I'm trying to focus my efforts on, on campaigning for proper changes to our hate crime legislation and you know proper changes in how we deal with online abuse and accountability for that. Um, because you know it's bad enough if you're a woman but if you're a woman talking about any other form of additional discrimination the trolls really well come out to get you and men do not like to see women have opinions on these sort of topics because they will try and shut you down and tell you that you're you're not a victim or or some other way to diminish your experience so there's a lot of nodding heads there in the in the rest of the panel about, about online abuse does anybody else want to touch on that I just want to reiterate what Rachel said. You could put the most simplest of tweet out. I whenever I was in Tenerife last year, my husband took me away for my 30th birthday and I had posted a picture of me on the balcony about to go out and have a good time. Something like the big girls ready to have an, a, a day out or something. And then trolls, oh yes, you're definitely a big girl. Look at the state of that. What is that? All the, just the most randomest, horrific things. It's awful. It's awful. And like Rachel said, I think there needs to be more around hate crime legislation and Twitter and Facebook need to have to, to sort of look at it as well, definitely. It seems as if some people would be happier if you hated yourself, no matter, you know, you could be the oldest, the youngest, the thinnest, the, you know, the curviest, the whatever. Um, and, you know, uh, what was that? The, uh, you could be the ripest, juiciest peach and there's still going to be someone that hates yeah. peach. Um, Lily, you, you look as if you were, you were wanting to say yeah, something. I, I wanted to say something because I know we're talking a lot about the hate crime legislation and 
uh, my experience after the Black Lives Matter protest has actually made me realize even if we get that legislation, it might not help us because the people who are going to be implementing it have, have not grappled with racism in society. And um, I have received a lot of abuse and uh, people will forward me because I'll, I'll be honest, I do not read comments that people put under my Twitter or my Facebook. I just don't have space in my mental health for that nonsense. So what I do, I post whatever I post out there. And if I see one or two that I feel strongly, I have to reply, I reply, but I switch off completely from that because I can stand with whatever I put on social media. But people will send me messages that they have seen trying to empathize with me and there are some of the messages obviously if a friend sends you a message you will want to see what they are saying so you will say uh, arrest her and deport her the, you know the n the n word being used and i haven't bothered reporting it because we have reported so much hate crime and racism and nothing has happened you know the people who have been uh, abused in this way they haven't really received that justice. So the system has not been designed to support minority ethnic people or marginalized communities in Northern Ireland. Are those, system, so, sorry, Lillian, are those stories in the, in the media, whenever those incidents that happen, are they just noted as this is something that's happened? Or is there ever any more context to it that's provided? Is there any examples of journalists who are doing it well and actually giving you the space to talk in a way that you would want to? Um, I, I, I honestly don't have any example I can, I can use in terms of a story, for example, of uh, a person who had been racially abused or attacked that has really received a lot of support from, uh, you know, the media. The, the, the stories are covered to showcase by what has happened in society, but there is always a but. We, there's always a justification. We do not, it's a small minority, but we forget to say that small minority is dangerous. And there's a lot of people who are complicit to it because they come up with those statements that say, this is a small minority. Our community is welcoming. Our they never really deal with the racist issue. They only defend their community as a welcoming space for people while minority ethnic are saying, how is it welcoming? Well, nothing is actually happening. You know, it, it cannot be welcoming if racism is increasing more than sectarianism and it, racism only affects 1% of the population. It cannot be welcoming if the policies that are supposed to be implemented to protect our community are not, are not implemented. It cannot be welcoming if we cannot have our allies speak loudly about the injustices of minority ethnic communities in Northern Ireland. So that is just a picture we are painting to, to cover up the reality of the community that we live in. Thank you, uh, Lillian. Rachel, could I just ask you, um, I, I know that in your role as the women's sector lobbyist, it's, it's part of your role to, to build up relationships with journalists and, and with the media, um, and that you do have a lot of engagement with a variety of people. Some of that has been negative, as, as we've already covered, and, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, this is a lot of food for thought for, for all of us and for, for any of our, our journalist colleagues watching, but you've also had some good experiences where you know, we're trying to point to best practice. So I think it was one of the, the, the reporters that worked for BuzzFeed uh, previously that you built up a good relationship and felt that they were reflecting what you were wanting to say in a way that you were happy with. Could you talk to us a little about why it was a good experience? Yeah, definitely. So there's been a few different journalists that I have built up really good relationships with, and they have all been women. <laughs> um, because I think, you know, there, you'd be hard pressed to try and find a woman who's a journalist who hasn't also faced a lot of online abuse, um, yourself included, Amanda, even look at what happened when we uh, launched this event and the amount of abuse all of us got underneath. But uh, so I found a few different women who reached out to me over the years on different topics. Um, where particularly I was talking about things to do with disability uh, and abortion really, because it's a, it's you don't really see many voices from the disabled community when it comes to talking about abortion. You usually only see people using disability. And one thing that I found quite useful from those women over the years is they would say to me, you know, what are, what are the main facts that you want us to make sure that people know about this? Um, and, and what is happening 
uh, in the law right now clearly and instead of going into the different arguments for and against um, they would really clearly highlight how uh, you know how connected to international disability law and women's uh, human rights law as well and you know it just is so refreshing to actually have someone want to amplify your voice on something that is so rarely discussed um, so I really do think it's amazing when women journalists do that because you can compare it to other things like I got a request a few weeks ago um, I've been working loads on the domestic abuse and civil proceedings bill that was passed recently and it's something that is extremely um, important to me particularly because of you know the huge levels of domestic abuse against disabled women and rather than talking about how you know this is what we've achieved but we actually have loads of gaps compared to the rest of the UK you know there's still so much that we need to do I got asked if I would go on the radio to debate a men's rights activist around how this bill went too far uh, and you know are we going to criminalize whistling at women yet and you know if it's a disabled woman are you not able to you know so if you have to lock them away for their own good that you know that should be accepted I'm like what in what world would I want to debate this so actually looking at who who benefits from this discussion am I actually amplifying a marginalized voice against a conspiracy theorist um, or a misogynist or you know are, are Am I talking about balance here or am I trying to stir up controversy at the expense of someone's emotional well-being? Um, because, you know, as, as a disabled woman, I hate to see debates happening around disability as if we're not people who can have uh, our own independent thinking. So really looking at it and going, what am I platforming here and who does it benefit? Amanda, just to, to come up on what Rachel has said, you know, um, I'm sure a lot of people have watched the BBC choose to challenge the two minutes that we got. I think that's a very good example of how you can project a minority ethnic uh, population in a positive way. And some of the things that you covered during the Black Lives Matter protest and continue to put on social media and challenging, I, I, I don't think I've given you credit about that because you have really received a lot of abuse yourself because of standing for Black Lives Matter. That is what you get. Uh, within a society that is uh, defending or denying racism. When you stand up as an, a, a true ally wanting to really uh, talk about the injustices, you become a target to yourself. So it, it, it sometimes I think some journalists find it difficult to do their job properly because they're being pushed out by this um, society that doesn't want to really listen to that balanced opinion that you're bringing. But I think what you guys have done today is as uh, three very powerful media or women in Northern Ireland, you have just stand, you, you literally took a stand against racism. You took a stand against injustices of my uh, marginalized communities. That is what I would love to see being reflected on mainstream media. Because you're, you, although you are powerful, you're three women, there's a big media uh, out there that could give people like you a much of a big platform because you seem to understand the issue. And if the newsroom will not have people like yourselves who understand the issue or people who from minority ethnic communities, then they will never have that balanced story that they can give to society. Thank, thank you, Lillian. Um, Stacey, we know in, in recent times there's been quite a few online initiatives. We know uh, the Her Loyal Voice uh, website. Uh, we know a, a new one has started recently uh, over on Facebook and a website's come in, Her Story, uh, Women and Loyalism. So there does seem to be, you know, we know that there have been loyalist women over the years who have, have, who have you know, put, put their foot forward, there, but there does see, seem to be a sort of increase in a, a modern way to try to platform those, uh, those views of loyalist women, because sometimes it can feel as if we're always talking to men or the spokespeople are, are always men. Now, you have had a lot of experience of, of media engagement. Has there, has there been any examples of where it's worked well for you, where you felt as if the, it, was a, it was a positive experience when you were engaging with the media, when you were engaging with uh, journalists, that you, know, that you were happy to do that and that you would be content to um, encourage your peers to, to engage with them? Amanda, I mean, overall, um, as a whole, I've had really, really positive experiences with the media. But again, what other people have touched on as well, it's generally the female journalists or reporters that you can build up a, a better relationship through shared experiences. But there are a lot of good models of practice in working class areas, um, sort of trying to empower key voices and empower young women 
and young loyalists. Um, you've got the Social Change Initiative. They do the fellowships. I'm involved in um, a grassroots leadership program with CFNI. Um, and there is people from rural areas. There are LGBT people. There are ethnic minorities. Um, and it's just about amplifying those voices and giving them the tools and the skills so that they can speak and be effective leaders. Uh, Elspeth, can I just come to you next? Thank you, Stacey. Um, just about the, the representation of younger um, women in the media um, and young, young LGBT women as well. There can be um, a sort of uh, a tendency for it to be sort of a, a male gaze. It can be a tendency to present it um, issues uh, around lesbian and bisexual women uh, through men's eyes rather than actually listen to the women that are involved. Have, have you noticed that and perhaps the, the, the younger you are, the, the less likely you're, you, you're to be contacted for your views? Um, yes, I do think so. Unfortunately, there, there's always been an issue of invisibility, I think, for queer women just yeah, being ignored or being spoken about rather than being spoken to and asked, as you said, directly to speak for themselves and of their own experiences. Um, but what I would say, there is definitely a bit more of an open dialogue, even from 10 years ago or so when I was a teenager growing up. I think there's much more of an openness and an understanding of different identities. And so hopefully going forward, younger women will have more of that confidence. And I think part of that is just social media and having that online forum of activism where people can really feel connected. Um, I know from my own work as well, working with older LGBT individuals on the Heritage Project, we're putting together an archive of voices from previous generations to try and show that we have a really strong heritage of that here. And it's just so often that um, especially female voices from even a generation ago uh, really just are forgotten about. So yeah, it's just about getting that balance, I think. Thank you. Anna, can I just come back to you for a second? You've obviously got the most experience of engaging with the media um, over, over your years, and we know you're re retired now, but uh, just if you could maybe highlight what, when does it work well? What are the circumstances in which it works well to engage with journalists? Uh, very often, most of the time really um, got on very well with journalists. Um, really, and I suppose as a politician, they would interview me on various issues. So they don't always pitch and hold me in racism. And sometimes when they come to when they came to me and asked me to speak on racist incidents, I said, "Don't be lazy. Don't just come to me. You know, you're too lazy. Go and find someone else to talk about it." So I would be interview on environmental issues because I was chair of the Environment Committee and and domestic violence, and you know, I've always supported you know women's rights, and and I had personal experience in domestic violence as well. So I would have talked about on a, a range of issues. So I really don't feel too badly done by, by our local media here. But, you know, but in terms of diversity, we are very lacking here with our local media. There's no doubt about it. Um, well, as you see, you know, better now uh, with the national media. So, um, no, my and I think I, I certainly find journalists quite quite sympathetic. But in terms of someone mentioned about follow up, or you said about follow up for journalists as coming out, this is a big story. There's a racist incident. We need to report about it. So it's the visual, and they like to do it, but they don't really want to delve into the systemic uh, racism that that Lillian talk about kind of wants to talk about, start to talk about the racial equality strategy, you know, that's nothing has been done about it. And there is almost a glaze over their eyes and say, oh, wait, let's move on. So there is that laziness of wanting just a visual image, if you like, and that they like, and then there is no follow up. You wouldn't see them coming back a couple of days later to find out, you know, what, what happens to the family, are they okay? And, you know, so I suppose that's what media, you know, news come and go and you, you, you don't have a lot of time to report on it or to follow up on it. Yes, yeah, so there's, there certainly are limitations on, on time and, and on resource yeah. as well, but there's certainly a lot of uh, lessons that we can learn from our discussion today around sort of looking beyond narrow issues and mm -hmm. educating yourself and speaking to people and finding out how they want to be addressed and how they want to be spoken about. 
Um, so there's there's lots for uh, there's lots for us all to think about. Um, I'm conscious that we're running out of time. We could probably have filled the whole day with, with this with this panel discussion. But if I could just do a quick round, because we know it is International Women's Day, and we want to try um, and sort of empower women and inspire women as well. So I'm going to ask you each for a small snippet of one of the best bits of advice you've ever been given. If you could start with, we'll start with Lillian. Um, I think the best advice my mother has ever given to me is that never be afraid of speaking your mind or doing the things that you believe is right. And uh, looking at what she has done herself in her life, she's never shied away from being who she is. And I see a lot of my reflection from my mother. So that is the best advice I can give to anybody. Anna? I remember when I first talk about racism, the Chinese elders in the community told me to be quiet, to stop. You know, you, you sound too angry. And, um, you know, you only make people really just um, think you're over the top. So my answer to them is you need to talk about it. And there are other people, there are good people out there who would sympathize with you, who would support you. But if you don't talk about it, nobody would know. And the bullies will continue to bully you. So to speak out and you, you know you're, you have your own experience, you know you're right, speak out. Elspeth, we we'll can move to you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, I think... Um... A general piece of advice is just to think when you're doing something you know why not you it's something definitely everybody in this panel embodies if, if you don't see something happening um or a topic being addressed just think well why can't you talk about it you know you don't have to sit back and wait for someone else to do it and i think maybe as women we are told not to be dynamic and not to be forthright well i think you know you have to just go out and make the change if you if you feel passionately about it and as i say everyone here is definitely doing that in spades Great. For me, things like this, um, an increase in my confidence doing things like this, I suffer really badly with anxiety and have that wee devil on my shoulder of self-doubt. Um, and I think it stems from a really, really bad experience. Um, I was the only person in my class to pass the 11 plus, went to a grammar school um, and had a really awful experience in the grammar school where people were making snide remarks about my accent. Oh, you're only a shankle millie. Um, we were doing career days where you had to talk about your parents' occupations and my mommy was a cleaner and I come from a single parent family and it was sort of, I was going to myself, I'm really out of my depth here, I'm not good enough to be here. Um, I left the school lucky enough to leave with um, GCSE from the girls' model um, but that we self-doubt and that we niggling about confidence was always there but I just think now it's just fake it till you make it. If you believe so strongly about something, just speak out and if you're feeling you're not being represented, who better to represent you than you? Brilliant, Stacey. Well Thank said. you so much. I feel uh, radicalised in a good way by this conversation today. Um, <laughs> Rachel, I would just pass to you for your final thoughts. Yeah, um, so I think my the best bit of advice I ever received, it actually came from my mum. Uh, my mum is an amazing woman. She's a powerhouse of a woman. Like she worked in a bra factory, started all union work, was the captain of a darts team and all the rest, and just loved making people feel uncomfortable with not being used <laughs> to women like her. And one thing she said to me when I when I first went to university, I was the first one in my family to ever go to university and I was really struggling. Um, when I first got there, I just didn't feel like I was welcome and I was really struggling adjusting my disabilities and stuff. And she said to me, um, Rachel, if people are uncomfortable with what you've got to say and you being there, it's because they're not used to people like you challenging them. So keep challenging them and keep saying what you've got to say and scream it from the rooftops. <laughs> so I did that and I very much try and follow my mum's footsteps that way. So keep challenging people because they're not used to people like you. So keep doing it. Thank you. Stacey, Rachel, Elspeth, Anna, Lillian, it's been my pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for taking part in today's event. Um, I hope uh, and I can see from social media and from the comments that the, the people have really enjoyed your contributions. I think that after having watched that last panel, we're all feeling quite inspired and, and radicalised, as Amanda said in a good way. So as I said, again, I'm Alice Morris and my panel is going to be Women on the Front Line, Reporting in Troubled Times. And with me today is a woman whose work I've admired for many years and so was delighted when she agreed to take part in this panel. The fearless Nicola Talent is an investigation <laughs> in the Sunday world. 
Um, she's a best-selling author and holds a higher diploma in criminology. Her podcast, Crime World, is the number one in the Apple True Crime chart. She has produced and presented a number of crime documentaries and is a regular contributor to TV and video shows about organised crime. Um, I'm sure most of you will already know the work of Mandy McCauley, the award-winning investigative reporter for BBC and I Spotlight programme. Mandy started her career in video, making documentaries for RT1, Video 4 and Video 5 Live. Her work has been recognised with nominations and awards from BAFTA, the Royal Television Society and Amnesty International. In 2007, she was part of the BBC Spotlight and Panorama team that exposed Northern Ireland as a hub for international dog fighting. And she has investigated high profile murders, child sex abuse, and alleged bullying and corruption at the heart of government in her exposés on NAMA and Red Sky. Last year, she won a Royal Television Society Award for the BBC Spotlight Secret History Investigation into Collusion in Middlestar in the 1990s. And last but certainly not least is broadcast journalist Jane Lockery. Jane also started her career in radio stations in Oxford, Cambridge, and eventually ITN. Jane has worked for UTV as a reporter and then correspondent from she returned to Belfast in 1992 until last week. She's reported extensively on the troubles, the ceasefires, trials, the historical abuse inquiry, and spent a considerable amount of time with many of the families who've been bereaved because of the violence here. During her career at UTV, she made a range of programmes, including several about the Oma bomb, and also contributed to a chapter about her experiences reporting on the atrocity in the book, Reporting the Troubles. So thank you very much, ladies, for joining me. I really want to just start at the very beginning. So I'm going to start with your yourself, Nicola. When asked why I went into journalism, I would say, which reflect on something that one of the last panels, Stacey, said, I come from a very working class community in West Belfast. We've always had newspapers in the house and the portrayal of my community in those papers was not what I recognised as the people who lived around me. And so I thought, well, if someone isn't telling your story, right, tell it yourself. And that was one of the things that attracted me into journalism, the thought that you would be able to give people from those marginalised communities a voice. So what was it that attracted you to journalism? And just can you go back to the start of your journey and tell us how it began and how you ended up working in the, the field that you do in the field of crime journalism? I don't think I was quite as honourable as you, Alison. I kind of went into it because I thought it was going to be a fun career. And um, I just, I reckoned it was going to be something that I could maybe travel with. I had high hopes of being a war correspondent. Um, I had nobody in journalism in my family or anything like that. It was just something I always wanted to do. So I went straight into a certificate course after school. And in those days, there was only one course in Ireland and the employers were queuing up for us when we finished. And we actually got a job out of it. Like when you think about that now, it's bizarre, but yeah. So we got placement and essentially a job. Um, I started in local media and then I started covering court cases and um, sort of really took whatever work there was, which I think most journalists have to do in the beginning, worked in a restaurant at night and got shifts on national newspaper and eventually landed in the special criminal court covering the cases of the Gilligan gang. And that was after the murder of Robert Gear and they had all been brought home from the UK to appear in that court. Um, first time it was used for gangland crime and it was just fascinating. And that was me done then. I never looked back at any of the other areas that I had been writing about. I just I just did get a sense of justice from it, I have to say. And uh, there was maybe a little bit of a, I just had an interest in that world then. Um, so it went from there. Yeah, Jane, yourself, how did you get involved in journalism? Was it always something that you'd wanted to do from, from a very early age? Well, um, when I first uh, met with the idea to my career teacher in school that I would quite like to be a journalist, um, I was told that I'd be best to go and learn to be a secretary and to type. And I went, right, okay. Um, and then uh, I obviously ignored that advice, um, went to the university, went to Queen's, and um, where I studied psychology and English. And while I was there, I got involved in the Gown newspaper. And um, the Gown newspaper then, we're talking in the, the 80s, well, they said, oh, that's really nice, Jane, you want to write, um, but we really need you to sell advertising space. So I went, right, okay. So myself and my friend literally 
wander the streets trying to sell um, the space in the uh, in the Gown newspaper. And we were very successful. We, I remember that year we got £3,000. We literally begged. And then I realised, well, actually, I do have sort of the powers of persuasion um, to persuade people. <laughs> um, so uh, then I, I, did, I left um, Belfast when I graduated. And I went to um, what was called the London College of Printing, which is now the London College of Communication. And um, initially I started to, to work in print journalism, um, or to, sorry, to train in print journalism. And um, I spent a work placement in Hello Magazine, which I thought was fabulous, but it really wasn't for me. And it was all, it was, it was a very uh, interesting week, I have to say. It was a week the Berlin Wall came down and I realized and as I was, I would put Princess Diana's copy of a little magazine and posted it to Kensington Palace. And I thought, oh, this is my claim to fame. But I realized very quickly that as much as I enjoyed the week, it wasn't for me. And I really, I wanted to be on the Berlin Wall um, reporting. Um, and I realized that I wanted to be a news reporter. So I moved on then. But in, the, in that time in London, um, with my accent, in the 80s, it was not tolerated really as much as um, it is now. It was all received pronunciation and Anna Ford. And indeed, I went for a job interview and I worked in radio initially, um, which is, I've always loved. I always think you can paint brilliant pictures on radio in your mind. It's fabulous. So I went, uh, I did a, an interview in a radio station in Suffolk. <laughs> and this lovely um, news editor said, Jane, I would love to employ you. You're a natural journalist, natural broadcaster, but um, I'm sorry, but I don't think your accent would, would be appropriate in the, in the sort of leafy um, fields of Suffolk. And I you wouldn't get away with that now. And I really respected him. I mean, he was a very good um, news editor, but um, so I, I ended up working on national news reading and writing the news for Classic FM at the time, because literally because it was much more difficult then um, to uh, to get a job with my accent at that time in, in England. But I never, I didn't take no for an answer. I, I got about over 70 rejections um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> at least, uh, but it, it was just basically that I, I knew this is what I wanted to do. I particularly enjoyed uh, the, the law part of it and the, the law exams we had to sit. Um, and then a job came up in, in UTV and the BBC on, on the same day. And, and my mum and my best friend sent me a, a, an ad in the Telegraph for it. And I thought, I'm going to apply. Um, and the rest is history. I was interviewed for both the BBC and UTV on the same day. And, and, and UTV offered me a job. And, uh, and then I've worked there ever since. I only planned to stay in Belfast for two years. And here, 30 years later, um, I'm still here. And um, I've had... It's a fantastic time reporting for UTV and it, it, at the time it was mainly a, a very male dominated profession um, but again I wouldn't take no for an answer and I ended up um, getting to do the stories that I really enjoyed doing which was the security type stories, the murders um, but it was the troubles and how did the troubles it basically that, that was what was happening all around and I really I really enjoyed that. And when it comes to the accent, it's only probably been about maybe the last seven or eight years that I've started doing like broadcast and commentary work. But because I am so West Belfast, the amount of emails and letters I would get from people correcting my speech saying, I heard you speaking on Radio Ulster, which was fine, blah, blah. But you remember, you should say, you know, and they're corrected it. And I'm like, I would never love, do you know what I mean? It's me on the radio. Like, <laughs> 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 Keep my brain on. Yeah. <laughs> um, Mandy, yourself, I mean, I know you've had a really great career. You started off in video as well, did you? I did, yeah. But I mean, just in terms of, of how I, I, I came to be in, in journalism, I think when I was growing up, um, I'd have been quite a shy teenager. Uh, I was very overweight. Um, I really came into my own when I joined the debating society at school um, and realised that when you were standing up on the platform, you could be anybody you wanted to be and you could be really passionate. And I think that was, you know, when I came into my own. But what happened then was, you know, I started uh, to, to, to watch uh, World in Action. I was watching Counterpoint at the time, but I can remember sitting uh, in the living room in our house in Portrush uh, watching World in Action and, and watching these people running along streets and, you know, giving voice to the voiceless and taking on legal armies and taking on establishments and thinking, my God, that's what I want to do, you know, shining a light. And I remember um, saying to the careers teacher and the careers teacher saying, look, Mandy, you know, we need to put, keep it in perspective. You know, you need to just, you know, keep, keep, keep yourself in the ground 
there, the chances of you running along the street after anyone is quite slim. Um, so anyway, but years later, um, I went on, I did English at Queen's, I, I specialised in Anglo-Irish literature, I, I love poetry, uh, poetry and suppose debating were my big things, and then I did the, uh, the journalism course at DCU in Dublin, and uh, when I was there, um, talking of World in Action, that was when um, Susan McKeith did her groundbreaking uh, programmes, um, you know, on the meat scandal, uh, Laurie Goodman. Um, and I was completely gripped and can remember thinking, you know, this is a, this is a, this is a woman journalist. She's taken on the patriarchy. She's taken on the male establishment um, and was in Dublin actually when the, the, the meat tribunal, the beef tribunal was going on. I mean, what a time to be alive and sitting by the ground, you know, by the canal with my wee transistor radio. I knew everything that, that was said at that tribunal and thinking, well, you know, if I could even do a fraction of what Susan O'Keefe has done, I'll be okay. Many years later, Susan O'Keefe came uh, to produce at Spotlight and, and it was actually, I'm sure she was affronted because I actually cornered her at the lift door and said, you know, my gosh, you have no idea, you know, the, the impact you had on me at that, right? Like when I was a student journalist, I just was so in awe of you and wanted to do what you did. And like, she was totally gracious about it, but she probably thought I was a bit of a rocket, but I always talk about the two Susans. The other Susan who inspired me and made me really want to, to be a journalist was Susan Mackay. I remember listening to, to or to reading Sophia's story, that like just completely groundbreaking uh, piece of work about, about the young girl that, you know, that had survived sexual abuse and also Protestants and unsettled people. So, so, so many female role models, you know, that have inspired me. Yeah. Nicola, you, like myself, you're a print journalist and I love print. Um, I, you know, I know that we all have to adapt and move with the times, but at the same time, I think there's so much power in the written word and that's the thing that I attracted me to journalism, the thing I love to do. And when you're reporting on those crime stories, I think that people see what it is they produce at the end of the day, but don't understand the amount that has to go into the, the background of that. First of all, it takes years to, to build up contacts and for people to trust you, but also I always feel very strongly that the, the people who are speaking to us, you know, the victims of these code of crimes and the victim of organised crime and gang on criminals, they are always putting themselves at much more risk by speaking to us than we're putting ourselves up by speaking to them. That kind of work that you do, um, I mean, talk, talk to us a bit about the, the, the sort of level of, uh, of, of dedication that has to go into getting those people to speak to you and, and the responsibility that we feel when they do speak to us as well. But that's I totally agree with you because I think really it's finding those stories and finding those voices within that world that tells the proper story. The full I mean, look, I will do a lot of um, you know, investigative reporting on major organized criminals and trying to get up close and personal who they are, where they've come from, and what sort of power they yield. But really to tell that story, you need to tell it for the people under them, the, the underlings who are terrified and who are living, you know, the people in the communities who are living in fear and who are actually living in the real world of that underworld, you know. So, yeah, I think it's extremely important. People, I suppose building trust, like with all sources, is something that has to take time. And it's a two way thing, isn't it? And you have to trust them. They have to trust you. I think at the moment, I don't know whether you find the same, but there is a lot of misinformation coming through on, um, you know, encrypted emails and various other methods like that. And, and what your people are trying to talk to you remotely and they're trying to deal with you on these encrypted things to for their own security. But actually, as a journalist, you're missing layers and layers of the things that, that build up the trust. For example, looking somebody in the eye um, you know, checking out who they are because everybody has a motive. I think most people anyway have a motive when they come to you with a, with a story. And sometimes you can work it out what it is and be okay with it. They might mm -hmm. want to get the other guy caught or whatever, but uh, sometimes you can't, you're not okay with it because you realise that they're trying to use you in order to, for example, have somebody killed, uh, which is the worst case scenario or whatever. But, you know, there's so many different methods we use that we don't even realize we're doing when we're trying to work out, you know, the trustworthiness of a source. And um, I think it's really important with journalism, with the way it's going. And I think with this pandemic that we're so locked in to our homes and our computer screens, 
that we get back as soon as we can to the field, boots on the street to go out and actually meet people, sit down, have a coffee, whatever you do, and to, to try and work out who they are. But yeah, building trust is something that happens over years. And I think then maybe as you, the longer you're at the job, people kind of come to you and how can I trust you? And you kind of use your career as that. And you say, well, look, I'm 20 years at this. So, um, you know, therefore maybe there's one, one way you can trust me. I wouldn't be still in the game if, if uh, you know, I was getting people um, into trouble or I was, you know, doing, you know, mistrusting my sources, but they're very vulnerable. These people in these communities, extremely vulnerable. And I'm sure like me, most of the conversations I have will never be told, unfortunately, and can never be told, but they do form part of your tapestry of understanding of that world. And, and you can use them, the stories and, and what you hear in order to comprehend and try and educate other people into what that world is really like. It is, and because we live in, in a small island and the stories that you're doing and the people that we're, we're dealing with, it's not like, I suppose, if you worked in a big media world like London, you could speak to those people and then probably never see them again. But I, mean, I have met, you know, I've done murder trials and then met the, the person in a bar afterwards, you know, who has managed to be acquitted of a murder. Um, you bump into them all the time. And so you have to have a, a trust and an understanding with people um, and an empathy, which is what I think, Jane, when we had spoken and you know, I've spoken to you before, we had done this. I think that one of the things that people had always respected about your career is that I think our profession took a bit of a, a, a hit when you think about Levison and all the other things that came after that. We have this sort of, you know, Trump style fake news, Trumpism trying to attack the media. But when we're getting into houses, especially when there's been a huge tragedy or there's been a bereavement, or you're talking to someone at the most, you know, the most vulnerable and tragic time of their lives, it's doing that with, with an empathy and with an understanding that you're doing it with their best interest at heart. I think you've always been very good at sort of capturing that difference between covering hard news, but doing it, I think, with a soft touch. Well, thanks, Alison. It's, um, I think what Nicola said is absolutely right. It's trust. Trust. I think two of the most important things that a journalist can ever learn is that they have to be kind and it has to come naturally to you. Being a kind person, you will get a lot more out of people by being horrible. I mean, that's human nature, but this sort of stereotypical journalist, hard hack sort of thing, you know, I don't believe in it, to be honest, because you just absolutely, if somebody, if you're a nice person, if you come across a nice person, people will want to talk to you. And it is extremely difficult. And we've all done it, all the journalists on here, um, to go to the home of somebody who is at their lowest, that have lost somebody. And you are, I mean, first of all, they're usually a member, you, you live in Northern Ireland, these are your people, and you are in a sense grieving with them. You know, because this is an awful thing that's happened, whatever side of the community it, it happens to, the tears are the same. So you go in and it's a very, I mean, it's very difficult in terms of television as well, because not only are you, you're asking to go into their home at the moment, they're at the lowest with a, tea, with a camera crew to go in and do an interview. So, I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult a thing for anybody to agree so they, they have to be up for it 100 percent. they want to do it but invariably i have found that people are um they want to talk to you i've rarely been turned away but of course if somebody says no i don't want to talk you absolutely respect that and you walk away and you never try again unless they want to come back to you at a later date um but i mean i remember being at the door of michael gallagher literally three hours after he lost his son aiden in the oma bomb um, he, his real name was Adrian, but he always called him Aiden. And I just remember him standing at the door and he'd never met a journalist in his life before. Um, and I remember asking him, I said, Michael, I'm really sorry. I mean, that seems inadequate even to say what you're going through. And at that stage, I wasn't sure whether he'd find him or not. I mean, we, we, we thought he had, but he literally only found him in the morgue. He'd been searching for him through the night. You can imagine what a ragged, awful state that man was in. But yet he really wanted to say something. And I remember sitting in the living room with him and his um, daughter, Sharon, and he talked about him beautifully, but he kept saying to me, but Jane, he only went in to Oma to buy a pair of jeans. And I always remember him saying that. And it, it was a very poignant moment. And, and that, that is one of, of like hundreds, thousands of interviews I've done in the past 30 years. And each one is very special. And it's not just the, the, big, the, the, the huge atrocities that, that we all know about, but it's other people that maybe be remembered so much and you've been in their homes too and it has meant as much to be sitting with them in their living rooms as it has been with the people who have suffered an, an enormous loss in, a, in an atrocity um, and I, I find that it, it, 
people's forgiveness is something else that is just incredible. I don't think I would be that forgiven. I mean, it, it, it really overwhelms you sometimes and you're sitting and listening to them say, but I forgive the person that killed my son or my daughter or my husband or my, my brother. I mean, it is that to me is always something that is, um, it's unforgettable really, that level of forgiveness here. And you're great. Like most people are really, you know, they're glad to have you there. And I think it's because it's afterwards, people have said to me, when you came to my door and spoke to me, when I look back, there was a permanent reminder of the person that it was. And also yeah. because of the work I'm doing, you're dealing with, you know, crime and security. And a lot of times the victims in those cases can themselves be victim shamed and there can be excuses made as to why that person was targeted, why that person was killed. And a lot of times their families just want to talk about them as the person that they were and that they knew. Um, and so I think that that's what makes them much more amenable when you, when you come to the door and they, they do want to want to speak to you. Um, but I was saying to Mandy your, yourself, you were talking about of all the stories that really impacted you. You said it's like trying to pick a favourite child, like because they all have a different impact in a different way. You, you come attached to every single one of those, those stories. Um, there was a story that you did specifically very early in your career about a, a young woman who was, um, who was murdered. Um, and you said at that time, you remember thinking, you know, that was one of the things that stuck with you throughout your career. Yeah, absolutely. It was, um, I mean, people say to me, you know, about doing stories. Um, I, I, I would say I don't actually do stories. I actually go on journeys with people. Um, and some of those journeys can last two or three years. I mean, the Howell trilogy, I, I actually, you know, um, came back from having my first child to do programme one. And actually, uh, program three, um, uh, I interviewed Daniel Howell about four weeks after I'd had my second daughter. So um, you go on very long journeys and it takes a long time to build up trust. But yeah, one of my most memorable stories and the one the one that I think maybe I'm, I'm least connected with, but that I'm maybe one of the ones that means a lot to me is whenever I was just starting out in, in, in radio, um, there was a young girl, a beautiful young girl from West Belfast called Maria McConnell. Um, you probably remember the pictures of her in the paper at the time. She's gorgeous, sort of black um, ringlet hair, and she came from Coolnacilla. Uh, she had gone missing um, uh, in Belfast, and um, I, I met her parents, the late Nula uh, and, and Frank. He, he was a chemist, um, and uh, I, I reported on that story. And very tragically, it was a very tragic story. Maria was found murdered um, in, in Belfast, and I, and I spent time after that with her parents. Got to know them. I remember spending time in in the garden out the back of their house at Kilnasilla, sitting in the swings with her mum Nula, um, and Nula telling me that she had found diaries. Maria's diaries and her prayer journey or prayer journals and it had turned out that you know in those um, diaries and journals Maria um, you know had talked about her journey her battle a very courageous battle with severe depression and anxiety um, and it sort of documented how she had come through that and how just before um, she was murdered she was coming out the other end and she had such you know great hopes for her life and, and Nula said to me you know, if there's anything, anything at all can be taken out of, uh, of, of my daughter's death, I, I would love, you know, those um, journals and diaries to be shared. Um, at, at the time, um, you know, I had come through my own um, uh, experiences with depression, anxiety. Uh, it's not something I talk about. Um, but, um, you know, Nola obviously felt that I, I would, would do those, those writings Justice, and I brought it to RTE, and we made a documentary, a radio documentary, uh, which went out in RTE One. A girl called Maria, um, and uh, we put Maria's writings, uh, you know, onto onto tracks. Um, and to cut a long story short, the the program went on to win uh, one of the coveted international gold medals um, at the New York Film Festivals. It was actually my breakthrough piece of work. Um, it brought me out of a very dark place um, and it's one of those things that people say to me and have always said to me, why on earth are you attracted to such dark stories, Mandy? You've done paramilitaries, you've done dog fighting, you've run after neo-Nazi dog fighters, you know, what is it? And I say every single time you find light in those stories. I mean, I go into very dark areas to shine a light, but in every single one of those stories I've ever done, I have met and, and you know, become friends with some of the most inspirational people I will ever meet. And in that story, 
the one that launched me that started me off it was it was um it was maria's mother nula one of the most inspirational people i think i've ever met yeah nicola yourself you specialize in that sort of organized crime and gangland crime i know you said that you started you know you sort of became addicted to that type of news when you were covering the gilligan trials there was a period then obviously that there was a huge clamp down on that kind of organized crime because of the murder of veronica Gearn. And then in recent years, we have seen a rise in that kind of organised drug crime, especially in the South, which led to numerous murders. And you have been right at the heart of all of those stories, breaking those stories and bringing them to us every Sunday. I mean, for the journal students that are, are watching, that kind of very difficult and dangerous work. Um, can you explain to them just the, the process behind that and also um, the people that you're dealing with in relation to that and the sources that you have to deal with and does it do you think it helps or hinders that you're a woman because i deal with paramilitaries on a very regular basis and people have always said you know when you're going to do a room to deal with a room full of paramilitary men what is the reaction to you being a woman i think it's sometimes it might put them on their back foot because they might be more defensive it's as if the male journal is coming at them i don't ever think that it's it's done me done me any harm i always say I went into a house one time to a load of men with balaclavas and a table full of guns and the guy in the balaclava said to me, before we start, would you like some tea or coffee or a green tea? I went back to the office. <laughs> just offered me a green tea. Mm -hmm. that we're doing, we're dealing with people who can be very dangerous, but at the same time, we have to communicate with them in some way or another. Yeah, that's true. I mean, the same... With the paramilitaries, I suppose the underworld gangland, it, it doesn't really, the only place women have in it is as second class citizens. It's quite an old fashioned world in one way. Um, women will get with a gangland character and there's, you know, there's a numerous women. So they each have a place. So it could be the wife, you could be the mother of the children, or you could be mistress number one, two or three. And that's just the way it is. Most of them are very high testosterone males working in that business. And um, yeah, women are women have a place. So it's a bit strange then when you're kind of coming into this as a reporter who sometimes is is putting them in the front page of the paper when they don't want to be or whatever. Um, so I'm not really 100 percent sure. I don't think it has been. It sort of makes you a little bit different, maybe. And maybe it makes them a little bit more open to talking to you sometimes. Um, it's definitely not hindered me, I have to say. But then I come from a place where I never think about that. I mean, I work in a very male environment as well. Most of my colleagues are males and most of the crime correspondents, apart from you or I, are males. So there's a lot of males everywhere. But I don't ever think of being just a female in that. I just feel yeah. I fit. There's never been a glass ceiling for me or anything like that. I just have always um, thought I was just one of the one of the guys or whatever it is. But um, and in a way, when I go in to talk to people in that underworld or in gangland, um, you know, it's it's sort of with the knowledge you have, you can fit in comfortably to a conversation with them because I'm not asking them the kind of basics at this stage. I would be kind of deeper involved or de have a deeper knowledge of what's happening sometimes and it makes the conversation more interesting and I think if they start off by wondering what is a woman doing here they sort of forget about that fairly quickly when we get talking you know um, so it's an odd one really it is an odd one and then of course you get horrendous abuse but yeah. I think that women in other jobs that are dealing with people of lesser morals I think the guards PSNI up at yourselves I think sometimes women solicitors, you know, women working in hospital services, another place where you're coming face to face with, with these people, I'd say prison officers, all those people, they, they, they just, um, it's very sexist really, like a lot yeah. of it. You just let it wash over you because it doesn't stick with me. I don't, it doesn't bother me. I don't know whether I've gone a bit sort of bulletproof or something, <laughs> but uh they can say what they want. It doesn't, it just doesn't, it, it certainly, I don't go home and go, oh my God, am I too fat? Am I too skinny? Am I too whatever, you know? But it's just, I think you just have to accept that that's the way that world speaks. That's the way it operates. And that's the way sometimes they see women. So, you know. It's like, it, it's, it is like the, it's different kind of abuse because the, the sort of male colleagues who would work in the same field 
which are mis 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 me if they do something that has clearly upset someone that they're writing about it'll be a very different kind of abuse but the abuse I get back is always gendered it's always gender related okay. it's always, yeah they go because obviously you're saying it's not just a very high testosterone world it's a it's a very old-fashioned world in, in terms mm -hmm. of the particular structures of it as well so they assume that by attacking a woman's you know morals that that's going to hurt them where it's just silly me you know as you said after a way 20 years ago it might have annoyed me but now it just bounces straight back off me again because you can see exactly where it's coming from you know you can see the position it's coming from and I think well I'm clearly annoying you today I'm not a few of you resulted yeah. to that um, I suppose <laughs> in a way if we weren't annoying them um you wouldn't be doing your job properly as well <laughs> <laughs> Um, Mandy, in terms of the, the, the story, you know, you talked about the, the, the story that sort of touched you the most and that helped you come out of that, but I suppose one of the, the stories that you're known for was the dog fighting one, which again, I suppose, was putting a woman into an incredibly male world at that stage, wasn't it? And that well, took quite a long time. One of the things, yeah. but that story was 17 months in the making. One of the things I would say, and um, I have been very, very lucky in that working for the BBC and working for Spotlight, if you brought the story in, you got to do the story um and uh that has that it, ne it never struck me that it would be anything other than that um and also i've worked in teams you know a lot of my producers have been females actually the it was emma tolland who produced uh the pitbull sting the spotlight one um so you know it, it's just i've always been surrounded by women uh in spotlight but in terms of dog fighting i think that was the one that um, a lot of people maybe were shocked that, you know, a, a woman had gone in undercover with a team of top class uh, journalists, undercover Steve, uh, you know, RIP. He was, he was just one of, it was just a privilege to work with him. Um, and I, I remember, you know, uh, you know, going across Europe with them and, you know, Steve and I, we were posing as a girlfriend and boyfriend and, uh, basically finding ourselves in the middle of what was a dog fighting camp in the middle of the forest outside Finland where you know you had dogs hanging from you know trees uh, by the jaws to try and strengthen their jaws for the fight and also you know going to uh, you know going, going to undercover dog fights um, you know where basically when one of the poor animals lost uh, the owner you know hooked it up to the mains and uh, basically electrocuted it and then getting the opportunity to hold those people to account and to confront them. And I mean, the doorsteps that we did in Finland and also locally, um, I mean, they were just looking back now, they were just just crazy, crazy times. I mean, I remember, you know, lying in the back of a van for hours and hours in Finland, you know, waiting for one of these guys to come into a petrol forecourt so that I could, you know, then people go, 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 and your adrenaline would be pumping. And basically right up until the time, I mean, people say, you know, you must get used to doing doorsteps. And what I always say to people is, you see right up until the minute you open your mouth, I always think, what if I open my mouth and nothing comes out? You get that adrenaline rush every single time. Um, but I mean, that uh, dog fighting, I mean, I was working with a, a world-class team um, uh, and that was, that was brilliant because, you know, we did make a difference. Um, I don't think he would do this job because it is a vocation. I don't think he would do it if you didn't think he could make a difference. And we did get the laws changed and we did, you know, make a difference. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that, that, that means a lot. Um, but by goodness, we put the hours in. I mean, that was 17 months of blood, sweat and tears and worry and waking up in the middle of the night and thinking, gosh, what if something goes wrong? But I would have to say, I mean, one of the things that I have had is I've been surrounded by brilliant, brilliant teams. Um, and, you know, the, co the camaraderie, you know, out in the ground. I mean, some of the stories I couldn't probably tell, but, you know, just the camaraderie and the crack uh, over the years, um, just such a privilege to work with all those teams, you know. And that's one of the things I learned very early on in my career, you, you know, is, is teamwork, you know. Um, uh, teamwork's everything. If you've got a good team behind you, then, you know, you're, you're going to be okay, you know.
Jane, when we talk about frontline reporting, you and I have spent many years standing at actual rollings yes. <laughs> during parade disputes and riots where plastic bullets wasn't passed yet. Um, oh, and she said about the, the camaraderie of those events, there isn't a single one of us would have been standing at that uh, press line that didn't have an injury of some sort. My oh, lip was, oh, <laughs> I have a big scar on my lip where some wee smick in a selfie shirt threw a bit of plate at a cop at our down and it hit me in the, the mouth instead. And he was telling me I had to go to the photographer. I was like, no, it's fine, it's dead on. And he took a picture and then turned the camera around and it was like a fish hook. My lip was like hanging down. Was like, oh my God. I went to the hospital and while I was landing in the hospital, the facial surgeon, my phone rang and it was like a group trying to give me, like, give me a code word to claim. And I had to say to the doctor, could you stop a wee second? And she was like, you need to raise up yourself, love. <laughs> you know, your clear lip needs fixed. Um, but you're, I mean, we stood up there and like sometimes the crack we had, which you shouldn't have been considering you were in the middle of a, a riot, but you have a brilliant story about being, being injured at a riot. Oh, um, Alison, all I can say is if anybody wants to go to a riot, go with Alison Morris, because... <laughs> Um, in the middle of all the mayhem, and we were frightened. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, a petrol bomb could land on you. Um, a brick could hit you. I mean, a brick did hit me at the Tour of the North. Um, I think I've told this many times, but um, I was with Niall Donnelly, my colleague in UTV, and I was wearing, I have to confess, ridiculous shoes, a, a very hard lesson learned. Um, and I was a very young journalist, and um, it, I had just recovered from, I'd torn ligaments in my leg, and I'd been in plaster cast, but i just come out of the plaster cast, and it was, I was on duty, and I went to this riot, and this guy, the brick smashed down on my ankle, the same ankle that I'd been injured, with uh, torn ligaments in, and the pain, I thought I'd been shot. So I lay on the ground, and um, the, the rioter came running over, and I went, Jane, Jane, I didn't mean to get you, I meant to get a peeler. And he was about nine or ten, honestly. And then he said, I can get you a gravy chip. And I was like, no, oh my God. So anyway, I was taken then to the Matter Hospital where to have insult to injury, um, the lovely nurse who was fussing over me and I had quite a bad injury in my ankle, um, she thought I was a rioter. She said, well, what were you doing outstanding in the new lodge? I was like, excuse me, I was crying. <laughs> So, so the, the, really, the really bad years, I covered so many riots in one summer and so many parades that I was standing out in my back garden and next door we're having a barbecue and I was putting the washing on the line. And the mm -hmm. next thing I realised it all went silent. <laughs> so was, but I was singing the sesh while I was putting the washing on the line because it was a song that had been in my head so much because I'd been so many parades. <laughs> I was like singing along to the tune something while I was doing my washing at the house. Like the, the story, I suppose, that we, you know, associate with you most recently is the Regency and the Kennehans, everything that came along along with that. But in, in connection to that, and I know that covers such a long period of time, so many victims, so much violence. Which of those stories do you feel like is, you know, if you look back on your career in another 20 years time, that you'll feel the most proud of that you managed to expose that during your time as a, a journalist? I suppose the Regency is all tied up in the Kinnahan Organised Crime Gang, which I've been writing about for more than 10 years. And it's a journey, as Mandy speaks about when you when you do a story, it's a journey. And that certainly is a journey, a journey of understanding about what has happened and how a, you know, some street drug dealers from Dublin could turn into a mafia monster, uh, you know, in, in Europe. And it's a constant learning experience and there's a constant drip feed of information and it's constantly, the picture of it is constantly emerging. So certainly I would be sort of proud enough of my work on that. Um, you know, I've done, I've done a lot of stuff on that over the years, but similar to other, um, you know, things I write about, I don't seem to be able to walk away from them. They seem to go on and on and on and on. And I think maybe that's the nature of, how strong the stories are and how important they are to society because, you know, a, a good spread in a newspaper is a thousand words. So that doesn't tell much of a story re really when you think about it, trying to get, a you know, a big, big, you know, story that affects society into that amount of, of space. Um, I think I like the way actually writing is, we you know, that we have to be multimedia now. I love that. I love podcasting. I love doing little video bits and all the rest of it and telling the story in different ways. Um, I think it's it makes the job even more interesting for people starting out now. Um, the written word has always been where I suppose you get really, really in depth. I mean, obviously on, on some high funded documentary, um, you can do that as well. But I think in the written word, you can you can uh, 
you can have the time and the space to go out after a story and to be allowed to develop it into something that really is uh, significant for our society because all that drugs thing, I mean, that's where it started for me really with the Gilligan thing and all of a sudden I'm writing about these people and, um, you know, on we go. And uh, it's all a big journey and it's an ever-changing world out there when it comes to drugs and it's happening so swiftly, it's changing. The gangs are, are, are emerging and being killed off so quickly that, you know, if you if you sat for about five years, you could see the emergence of new groups, the finish of others, and, uh, you know, the deaths of God knows how many young people. So it's, it is such a fast moving world, but the story is, is a slow one in a way to tell that is just, and the more knowledge you have, the better I think you can, you can tell it. And it's amazing how the stories that you do, whether you're south of the border and I'm north of the border, those criminals, there's a complete another connection between them. Like I have reported stories and the guns that have been used in the murders in the north have been guns that have originated from Dublin crime gangs in the south. You know, and you can see that on an island basis. And that's the importance of having really good journalism, allowing people to take time to explore that, because that doesn't just impact on one community. People can dismiss it as bad or bad crime, but that impact of that, it goes right across our society, including the children, the young people and the ways of these people and everybody else who's, who's connected to it. And that's part of, isn't it, part of the story and part of the thing that gets you hooked on, on continuing to cover up. Absolutely. And like, you know, policing would say nowadays that their only strength is in cooperation with different territories and across borders because that's what criminals have done. They no longer live within their own territories. They are now international. They are all global in some ways. And I think in crime journalism, it's important for us all to connect as well and to swap information and maybe be a little bit looser with, with giving other journalists stories. I mean, I, I have been interviewing last week um, a journalist in the Netherlands, Saskia Bellman, who's covering a trial that is connected in with the Kinnahans and there's connections up in the north as well. And she's actually working in the under the Umbrella Media House company, which owns INM now. So um, yeah, there's journalists across the world that, you know, we all need to swap our information in a way because that's what's going to make us better at our job and, you know, give 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 other people an ability to, to, to get right down deep into the story. And our, our work sort of crosses over, not just in terms of that, but in terms of, um, Mandy, when you have covered massive stories such as Nama and Red Sky and others, you can have stories that the, the print media can be running with, but that like yourself in Spotlight or Panorama, you have the time, the, the resources, as you said, the teams behind it, you can really deep dive into those investigations probably in a way that a print journalist would never have the time or resources to be able to do. And that must be very satisfying being able to spend so much time in those stories. It's very satisfying, <laughs> but it's also very scary as well, because if, for example, you know, you're working on NAMA or, or, or Red Sky, um, you know, and, and there's a lot of, you know, print media across those, journey, those stories as well. And I would always say, I, I do have, and would always say, look, I have amazing teams behind me. You know, I have budgets, but there's always that fear, you know, my middle of the night fear, it's about 20 to five in the morning fear is, you know, if you have those budgets and you have those teams, by God, you better produce something that's brilliant. And it's that terrible fear. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because people will say, well, you had all that time and you had a great team. Is that all you've produced? So, you know what I mean? There is that pressure as well. I'm not saying that's that's a bad pressure. I'm not saying that's wrong, but it is something that that would keep that would keep me up at night. But um, but it just makes you, you know, more determined than ever um, to dig deep and, and to get the story out. I mean, one of the things uh, I always feel like a massive responsibility because a lot of the people who come to us, for example, in secret history, you know, they're people who maybe have been, you know, have spent most of their lives looking for truth or looking for justice. And maybe they've gone down other avenues and, and they sort of feel that this is their last throw of the dice. Um, and, I, and I don't take that, uh, I don't take that lightly, you know, um, especially in secret history, you know, and some of the families that you were dealing with, you just wanted to try to get answers for them because, you know, um, you know, dreadful atrocities had happened. And, you know, maybe some of these people have been spent 20 or 30 years. I mean, one of the other things, uh, just when you're talking about, when I'm talking about secret history is, and just, you know, the approach um, and, you know, you know, when I met, for example, Lawrence McGuire, 
um, who was in in the Mid Ulster um, one uh, a program. You know, a lot of people have have said to me, "My gosh, you know, it must have you know you, you must have had to you know it must have been hell on earth trying to get him to go on camera, and you know it must have been really difficult, and it must have been a lot of argy bargy, and you know all that." And actually, the, the, the truth is that, um, you know, he was at a location in, in the UK um, and, and how that came about was we had uh, finally tracked down where he was. We had driven along, uh, driven around that day. And by the time I got to his door, I'd said to the producer, look, give me 15 minutes. I'll knock on the door and see if he's in. Uh, and when Lawrence answered the door, I actually was so past myself and so frazzled and <laughs> bedraggled. I actually said to him, do you know what? I'm having a really, really bad day. You know, really appreciate it if you could just give me a bit of your time, Lawrence. And he actually looked at me and he went, God, well, I suppose you'd better come in. I'll make you a cup of tea. And that's how that uh, that journey with Lawrence started. You know, it's um, so sometimes it's, you know, you just have to be yourself. I always say, if you want somebody to give their heart and to, to, to tell you everything about themselves, you have to be human yourself and you have to give something of yourself too. You can't just walk into to a room or walk up to somebody and say, can you just give me an exclusive unless you're willing to give something of yourself as well, do you know? Yeah, and I do think that once you've built up that reputation and trust, it does become easier as, as time goes on. Become, although, yeah, I know people have all sorts of different reasons for speaking to you, and once you want to go back to right at the beginning, what Nicola said, it's why we need, you know, these restrictions to be lifted, because you can tell a character of a person very quickly when you sit down across the table yeah. for them, which is very difficult to gauge if you're trying to deal with some bad phone calls or the messages or anything, anything else. You know, there's nothing speaks that face-to-face -face contact. And what I really worry about our profession and the way our profession is going is that young people coming into the profession don't seem to, to, to realise a lot of it can be done because the multimedia stuff I love too, and I'm really looking forward to doing a lot more of that in the future. But that face-to-face -face contact is invaluable. You know, getting someone a message via Facebook and then, you know, getting them to send you back a comment and putting in the paper without ever speaking to someone would be alien to me. I can't understand how people do their job in that way. Um, but because of resources and how our career is shrinking and how people have less, less and less people in the newsroom, there, there's more of that going on. But like Jean, you've been especially, I think that you could teach master classes and how to go and speak to people and do so so with empathy. There's nothing quite like that, is there? In, in terms of there's telling not, There's not, but also it's really important as well to be in a courtroom and to be in a room where there, an inquiry's been held. I mean, these Zoom links now, I know, um, you know, like it has, it has to be the way at the moment, but to be actually in a courtroom or in an inquiry room and hear that raw emotion and, Unlike um, Mandy was talking about having you know great teams behind her and having all this time to do things, I, I have great teams behind me too. I totally understand that. But I did. I didn't have the luxury of time. Um, whenever you're producing something for the six o'clock news, you've got to be really accurate and really fast. Good script, simple script, and um, keep it all in the present tense, particularly for broadcasting. And um, I remember sitting in the HIA inquiry one time, and it really affected me. Um, that inquiry was so difficult because I mean, being a mum myself, and you don't even have to be a mum, obviously, to understand that any story about child abuse is horrendous, really difficult to do. And I remember sitting in the room and there was this um, child, now adult, who'd been horrifically abused and he had died two days before he gave evidence to that inquiry. And myself and a, a BBC colleague, Kevin Sharkey, we were sitting there listening to the evidence that was being now delivered by a lawyer and we didn't have very much time to turn that story around. But both of us decided that we wanted to, that that person would have their voice heard. And I think that's when journalism comes really to the fore. And that person's story was heard. He was anonymous, obviously, to protect him. But that sto his story was heard that, that evening. There was no relatives in the court. There was nobody, it was just us listening to it. And if we hadn't been there, nobody would have heard his story ever. And it was awful that he died before he could do it. But it was our only way of almost paying tribute that we were there, we were his voice. And that is what is so important. And you don't get that on the end of a Zoom as much. But no. sitting, the raw emotion in that in that inquiry room that day, I mean, the tears were tripping us because we were thinking this person, the most vulnerable of them was vulnerable, was so badly abused. And, um, and, and we were determined to have his story heard. And I think that's where journalism plays such a vital role and will continue to play a vital role. But the sooner we can get back out and do it in, in the proper setting, and actually see it, See, the, and I've been shielding, so I've had to do a lot of Zoom interviews, and um, and it's not the same. And you know, talking to families who lost loved ones through COVID, 
um, it is it's 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 hard to reach out to them as much. We have managed it, and but you just feel like you just want to give them a hug and just say, you know, I'm here, I'm listening, and you can't. But that's the way of it at the moment. No, I did a sex abuse story not long ago, and I actually went down and sat in the girls' garden because I just thought I can't do this on the phone. I can't mm-hmm. I can't have you pour out something so personal and so personal to yourself on a phone. It just seems appropriate. And courts, Nicola, you started off doing a lot of court reporting. I love courts. I, I think in another life, if I hadn't been a journalist, I would have been just a solicitor or something <laughs> because courts, and when you're covering those very lengthy trials, there's so much restrictions around the reporting, but you're building up at times, you know, you're building up a rapport with the victims during that time, even though you can't record anything mm-hmm. they say until the very end, but that useful, it becomes so useful, that face-to-face contact, because they get to know you every day from the trial. But also, I truly believe that someone is missing a trick by not setting some sort of sitcom in the courts because some of the carry on that goes on, especially in the magistrate's court during the day, I think is worthy of a Dairy Girls type, uh, type sitcom. Some of the court cases that I've sat through and had to struggle not to laugh halfway through. I remember yeah. coming out of the court, I covered it for like two weeks. This trial, it was a GBH trial, the guy ended up getting, the, he ended up getting acquitted and I got into the lift and he jumped into the lift with me. And he said, are you going to put it in the paper that I'm not guilty? And I said, but no you weren't found, you know, he says, are you putting in the paper that I'm innocent? And I says, no, you weren't found innocent. You know, you were found not guilty. The two things are very, very different. And I went, I will just say that, and walked away. And it was it, but they don't really understand that when you're sitting listening to the, the evidence and the people and the defendants and the comedy, sometimes it was one of those words as well, but they are. But you have, have started off your, your career, as you were saying, in the, in the special crime reporting, reporting there, which is fascinating. Um, and as a documentary, I'm sure a day almost in, in those courts. And you know, I've been back there late because the guards down here have had huge success against organised crime since that Regency Hotel attack in 2016. And they have actually rounded up and jailed 60 members of the Kinahan Organised Crime Group, which is huge when you consider the population. And most of them on serious charges for murder, conspiracy to murder, firearms, whatever else. And like you say, Jane, there's nothing like being there mm-hmm. in that in the courtroom to get that sense you get the menace of the individual perhaps in the dock but also of late I was I was maybe when I said that it's probably it was probably before a year ago because I haven't really been anywhere in the last year but um, there was a there was a, a special criminal court hearing about this conspiracy to kill and they played out some sort of wiretap evidence which was the they had picked up conversations between the would-be hitmen in the car as they were waiting for their their prey to come out of the house. And actually, it reminded me so much of when I'm out on a doorstep or when we're out working in the surveillance van trying to get a photograph of somebody because you could hear how bored they were because it is such boring work. You're just sitting, sitting, waiting, waiting. Uh, But they're having this conversation and to actually hear it in real time in the courtroom was extraordinary. They're talking about... The kids were looking for these particular mobile phones and they were so expensive and how are they going to get them cheaper? They had brought tea and biscuits with them to, you know, to have mid-morning while they waited for this guy to come out to be shot dead. Like it was extraordinary. And it was real just being there. And not that I don't know why I needed to be reminded of it, but it was just the value of life in that world and how little it is was really just amidst this conversation between the two guys. In the middle of it, a big troop of transition year pupils landed into the courtroom, you know, hustled in by the teacher. Just as the two lads were having the conversation on the tape about, one of them says to the other, sure, I can't drink whiskey, I just can't get it down. And your man, the other fellow says to him, try Captain Morgan's with some uh, fizz. It tastes just like a Solero. And I was going, oh, my God, the transition year students shouldn't be hearing this, you know, <laughs> going out to drink. And they get, and all the while we're in the middle of this conspiracy to murder trial, you know. So you do find little bits of comedy in yeah. the, everywhere you go. And it's a bit of a black kind of humour, but uh, maybe it keeps us going. And I reckon that journalists hang out together because a lot of their conversation isn't fit for the normal world. No. I had I'd said this to the girls we were talking before that you don't realise it's not fit for the normal world sometimes yeah. because we're so immersed yeah. exactly. in the world that we work in. Mm-hmm. And it's only if I would go out with mates who, you know, aren't journalists and work in other, other fields and I say something which I think is, you know, and you can see the horror on their faces and you go, all right, that's not normal, is it? You're not really meant to, to speak about that. It's not. Um, yeah. you know, in terms of, of, of advice and people who inspired you, 
in your early career, what was the, the best piece of advice that, that you ever got in, in your early days? Me? Is that me? Yeah, oh, sorry, Jane. Yeah, Jane. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Jane. Well, um, my, my mom always said never take no for an answer, um, which, which was true when I rocked to my 75 rejections um, at the very start. Um, but also, uh, whenever I was a journalist student in the London College of Printing, we were told we had 24 hours to interview a celebrity. And if, it was very difficult to do. And, and this is the 80s. And everybody's like, oh, no, I haven't talked to George Michael and all this. And I so thought, well, they're never going to speak to a student. So I rang ITN in Grayson Road and I asked to speak to Trevor McDonald, thinking he might be sympathetic to a journalist. And, and they said, hold on a second. And the next minute, his booming voice came on the phone, his beautiful voice came on the phone, went, hello, how can I help you? And I thought, oh my God, it's Trevor McDonald. Um, and I said, I'm <laughs> You know, I was nearly fainted. And he was a you know, News at 10 anchor. He was so famous in every household. And I said, I'm a journalist student from Belfast. I, you know, can I talk to you? I've got this, this awful assignment. I've got to interview a celebrity in 24 hours. And he said, oh, I would be more than happy to help you. And I found myself about three hours later sitting in, in uh, Grayson Road in the, in the headquarters with Trevor McDonald in the canteen having a cup of coffee. And he gave me this, and I had an old fashioned recording machine called a year with me, which um, journalist students wouldn't even remember. or we don't even know about. This is like a sort of really, really interview. And I did this interview with him, this marvelous interview with him growing up in Trinidad. And he said to me, sorry, to have a long story short, I said, I don't know how I'm gonna do this with my accent and everything and in, in London. And it's, it's very hard to get into this profession. And he said, Jane, he quoted me Tennyson's Ulysses and he said, a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for? And I've kind of, I've had, you know, we, we should just go for it. Amazing advice. I'm actually reading Trevor McDonald's book at the minute. Yeah. So I mean, tell us that you got to speak to him. Mandy, what about yourself? What was the best, best piece of advice you ever, ever received? <laughs> I think the best piece of advice, and it's so simple, it's actually quite corny, but it always, it just worked for me was, you know, I, I, I would sort of worry and fret and, um, you know, it's never going to happen for me. And, you know, I keep plugging and keep plugging and, you know, I'm not going to be fast tracked or whatever. It's just, I'm not one of the chosen ones. And I remember um, someone that I worked with saying, look, for goodness sake, dry your eyes. Uh, you know, if your ship doesn't come out, row out to it. Just go out and grab it yourself and have a bit of self-belief. And, and that's what I did. Um, I literally rode out to it and started to bring stories in that just, you know, couldn't be turned down. Um, you know, I, I think there's a big difference between self-belief sort of and egos that can be unhealthy. But, you know, I think, you know, another piece of advice I was given was, you know, Mandy, everybody's faking it, but like self-belief is 70%. Um, and when I was working in London for Panorama, it was quite funny because one of the senior producers said to me, is this a Northern Irish trait? But every time you come into your room or you ring us, can you stop saying sorry? Because I would have been for years would have said, you know, I'm really sorry, do you want to bother you? Or I'm really sorry. And they just said, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. You're definitely not going to get anywhere, you know, in London unless you stop saying sorry. And that was something that I had to, and I think a lot of women do this, but it was something I had to really consciously stop myself from doing it was like a tick that I would apologize you know and I think once I stopped doing that and became a wee bit more assertive I think that really you know that really helped as well. It does I don't know I think because I was raised by a, my mother big Alice's maniac like and she had us convinced that we're all amazing anyway so like there's nobody ever and like in her you know, Stacey was on force and her mother was a cleaner so my mother was a cleaner and when I went to work in the Irish news Brian Finney he wrote a, a column for us he had worked as a he worked in St Mary's and I said he rang the office and I happened to answer the phone and he said um oh I've been reading your stuff and blah 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 and I said oh you work with my mum in St Mary's and he says oh what does she teach and I said she doesn't teach she cleans your office but I remember thinking the, the assumption was because I was a journalist my mother was a teacher mm -hmm. not that my mother was a cleaner um what about your, yourself Nicola what's the, the best piece of advice you've ever had uh, from the most unlikely person ever give anyone advice um, I got a little bit of uh, advice one time to just stay out of office politics, keep your head down and yeah, do what yeah. you do well. Yeah. And actually, it was so the best. It really was the best from a like from a professional point of view. I mean, I've had much more serious life advice over the years. <laughs> but <laughs> from a professional point of view, sometimes you can just get caught into stuff that you have no control of. And, you know, really, it shouldn't bother you. So it's just a case of trying to stay away from all of that and just literally do what you do best. Yeah. And that was, it stood to me. Just I, I, 
exactly. Yeah, and I'd say to you, yeah, that's any, when you work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any young journalist too, you know, as long as you're, people say that our, you know, our profession is difficult to get a job in there. And I can see if you're, you're good at your job and you're bringing in stories, you'll get a job anywhere. You know, and I think that, you know, people are still employing. It's just that you got to go that extra mile. Absolutely. You know, when you come to someone who's so keen and I live and breathe my job, like I'm on the phone talking to, you know, people who most people would cross the road to get away from at 11 o'clock at night, you know, and I'm talking to the people at nine o'clock in the morning, there's no on and off, you know, in our profession, I always say, you know, if, if you, if you love a job, you'll never do a hard day's work anyway. So for me, it's, you know, it's not hard work because I do love it so much, what you do, especially in this kind of journalism, I think you have to immerse yourself in it so much. Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, for our third and final panel discussion today at the Women in Media um, Belfast International Women's Day Conference. So I'm delighted to be hosting a panel on social media campaigns. Is it grassroots activism or grand scale virtue signaling? And today we're going to be uh, discussing whether people who engage in rights campaigns on social media then become engaged in further activism and support, or whether they tend to like and share posts and not really get any further involved in campaigns. Um, what we want to do is to talk about how we can explore the backlash and abuse that rights campaigners, particularly women, face online. And joining me today to discuss these matters and I'm going to unmute their microphones so that we can see them all and hear everybody. Um, and joining me today we have um, three women who have been heavily involved in activism and campaigning throughout their lives and their professional careers. Um, Fatima Halawa is a filmmaker from Dublin. She's a social justice activist and campaigner she was falsely imprisoned in Egypt, later returning home to help her family run a campaign lasting over four years that secured her brother Ibrahim's freedom. Fatima has worked with a variety of NGOs in Ireland and across Europe, helping to train and advocate for the rights of minorities. She's also a youth facilitator and a trainer, helping young people from minority backgrounds feel empowered and in charge of their own narratives. Fatima holds an MA in Contemporary Screen Industry from DCU and has a Creative Digital Media Qualifications from BIT. We also have joining us today Senator Eileen Flynn, who made history in 2020 when she became the first Irish traveller to become a member of the Eroctus. Eileen has been active in the Irish Traveller Movement, the National Traveller Women's Forum and Bally Fermat Traveller Action Programme. She's campaigned and lobbied government for many years on rights issues, including accommodation, health and suicide and infant mortality in the traveller community. Eileen was a leading activist in the civic society campaigns to repeal the Eighth Amendment to the Irish Constitution, securing legislation which protected a woman's right to choose, and also campaigned for a yes vote in the marriage equality referendum. Since becoming a senator, she's focused her efforts on bringing forward effective hate crime legislation, noting in her maiden speech that no one has ever been prosecuted in Ireland for perpetrating a hate crime. Eileen attended Trinity College Dublin and Ballyfermot College before graduating with a degree in community development from NUI Maynooth. She has a twin sister named Sally and she's married to Liam and is mommy to Billy. She's an absolute dope because I've seen the photographs. <laughs> and uh, finally joining us on our panel today is Claire McKeegan, who is solicitor and co-founder of Phoenix Law in Belfast. Phoenix Law has been involved in a number of high profile and significant legal challenges, including successfully securing compensation payments for hundreds of survivors of institutional child sexual abuse, legacy inquests, and extending protection to transgen transgender religious rights and helping to secure same-sex marriage legislation. The firm also represents the families of the 48 people killed in the Stardust Fire in 1981 in the fresh inquest proceedings that are due to commence shortly. Claire successfully acted in the late collusion case of John Flynn through the High Court and the Court of Appeal and forced an admission of liability by the, by the PSNI and established guidelines for disclosure in troubles related collusion cases. She was the first solicitor in Northern Ireland to be instructed in the controversial closed material procedures cases involving closed court hearings. And through her abuse litigation, Claire has exposed pro prolific paedophile priest, Father, Father Malachy Finnegan, who was president of St. Coleman's College in Newry. 
and an unprecedented civil settlement resulted in the re resignation of former Bishop of Dromore, Bishop Makarevi, and led to a further 35 abuse survivors coming forward. Claire represents the families of patients at Muckamore Abbey Hospital in their successful campaign for a public inquiry and has represented the victims and survivors of historical institutional abuse in their campaign for redress. She also works on the campaign for the mother and baby home public inquiry. So here I'm delighted. Um, I feel totally inadequate at the level of activism and success that each of you have, um, have had in terms of the campaigns that you've been involved in. And um, I wanted to ask you a little bit to tell me about the, the work that you've been involved in, in terms of your activism, your campaigns, and how you came to um, how you came to be involved in them. What motivates them? Motivates you to become involved, and in, how did you find your voice? And I and maybe start with you, Fatima. Uh, thanks so much for having me here, Patricia, and it's an honour to be. Uh, with these amazing two other women and yourself. Um, first of all, I just like to wish a happy International Women's Day to every woman out there. And um, yeah, and this is really great to be on here. Um, I think the conversation is really important, just even the whole concept of um, this conference and this panel um, is really important. Um, I suppose if I was to go a little bit back in terms of like where it all started and um, how I got into this um, from a very young age, I think there was something around, um, you know, I grew up in Ireland, came here at a quite young age. And um, if I addressed the elephant in the room early on, I am a, a, I'm racially different, religiously different. And that was always a big struggle growing up here. And it was something that I witnessed from a very young age, um, just even in terms of like the Islamophobic rhetoric that we, I kept on hearing growing up or like, you know, um, just the conversations or being aware in terms of like the misjust, the, the just, the sorry, the injustice that were occurring all across the world and especially seeing that my parents were from, uh, come from an Egyptian background and then we'd go home always and we'd become aware of kind of like the, you know, um, what people were facing what, and how privileged we were in the world that we are living in today. Um, and also like across the injustice, let's say for example, that was happening in, um, that was always aware and attentive here at home in terms of like, like the Palestinian cause and what was happening there. And I think I was always, we got inspired early on here at home and, and how to speak up and how to voice um, our opinions. And that was really important. I come from a very big family of seven, uh, six children and seven including myself. So voicing our opinion was always something that uh, was really hard amongst <laughs> for my parents. So we needed to learn early on, how does everyone get their voices heard and get what they needed? Um, and I think um, just starting off kind of like in terms of like specifically to the campaign and the Free Ibrahim campaign and where it all started was um, my siblings and I were in Egypt and we saw the injustice that was ca currently happening in the Rabah massacre after the first ever elected president um, and people's kind of rights and, vo and votes were being taken away from them simply by a coup taking place in Egypt. And we decided, um, my three siblings and I, to head down and just kind of like see what was happening, but equally as um, you know, as a person of media who graduated from a digital media background, I also wanted to document, and myself and my younger sister wanted to document and be able to have both those grounds and be able to implement those. And we we went there, we were kind of like, we were, we had a, we had a mission, even though like, I remember at the time, my mom was not very pleased with us heading down. And she was like, okay, eventually, at the end of the day, it's your, it's your choice. Um, but we felt we had, while we were there, we had to contribute in whichever way we could. And we got involved, we, part we, were, we partook and kind of like documented the events, but equally as well spoke out in, in terms of like the injustice that we were seeing. And after the Rabah massacre took place in 2013 on the 14th of August, where up to now it hasn't been officially documented how many people have, were murdered that day, um, we went down to uh, attend the protest and to document the protest of kind of like the morning of these individuals and then we got caught up um, in terms of like the curfew we sought refuge in a mosque and we simply got arrested from the mosque there and then um, and the rest as I suppose is a bit of a history we got arrested my three siblings and I, my two sisters and I were arrested for four months um, only to realize that we were just simply um, 
released on a we went it was the first time when we got released we went to a court hearing we our lawyers didn't even speak um the judge simply said i thought i hope these four months taught you a lesson and this is something that still resonates with me until this day uh, and then we came home um and our kind of like our happiness was short-lived because ibrahim unfortunately till this day we don't know why um didn't come back with us and then we had to initiate and start a campaign um, kind of like not knowing or being aware of kind of like where do we begin, where do we start? We've just been this true horrific experience and kind of threw ourselves into the, um, the deep end and just we're, we're like, let's let's begin this. Um, and yeah, this is kind of like where our journey began specifically towards this campaign. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And maybe just picking up on that, Eileen, um, does that resonate, does what Fatima said resonate with you in the sense that it was her realization, I suppose, that she was different and was viewed as different that kind of contributed to her activism? Is that something that you find in terms of what made you become an activist and become involved, particularly at the start of your activism in advocating for the rights of travellers and particularly traveller women? Uh, firstly, I'd like to wish everybody a very happy International Women's Day. And, you know, I've followed uh, Fatima over the years and I absolutely love the work that uh, she does and put me after is a bit, a bit unfair. <laughs> uh, such a great activist. And, you know, to to be imprisoned and to be treated uh, in, in such a way, you know, I like in one sense, be, being an activist is very, very tough for but I wouldn't imagine going to uh, to prison for, for just doing what's right, you know. So um, thanks, uh, Fatima, for that. For me, as, as, as a traveller woman, like, I do think the culture uh, barriers that uh, traveller women and uh, uh, Muslim women um, have are similar. Like, you know what I mean? We pass over in a few of our uh, different uh, uh, culture values, if you, if you want to say that. And um, for me, if I'm, if I'm very honest with you, I was... It took me until I was about 25 years of age to accept myself as a traveller woman. Uh, younger to that, you know, being refused from shops, being refused, being rejected. And it, it kind of went into myself thinking, you know, something like I'm never going to be anything except uh, a, a traveller woman and nobody is going to, like, you know, not feeling that sense of belonging in, 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 in Irish society. So again, I used to use terms like all, um, um, oh, I come from a traveller background and trying to be ashamed of the fact that I was a traveller and like it, it regrets to this day, even those years that I lost in my life from 18 to 25 or even 19 to 25, you know. And then at 25, I got involved in um, in the pro-choice campaign and it really motivated me. I got involved then before that in the yes, um, the, the same-sex marriage uh, campaign. And that was kind of a starting point for me was in 2015, the same-sex marriage campaign. And for, for me, it was just seeing and living those inequalities, living in crap accommodation, getting treated like, like getting treated like shit, basically, excuse me language. And, you know, just people can fob you off and, you know, there's equality for, for, for people in Ireland, but just not for the travelers or not for the people from ethnic minority groups. And I found that very tough to deal with. So when I went back to university and I did a degree, I just wanted to get a piece of paper really to be as equal as anybody else uh, beside me, you know, and I did stand up. And it opened up my eyes to the inequalities that we experience in the world today, but also the inequalities that uh, trans women, uh, Muslim women, uh, women who are disabled uh, experience in, in, in the world today. So basically, you know, we see like, why didn't someone do something about that? And I just kind of came on board from educating myself. From opening, and like when you open up your two eyes to the to the end, just in the world it's very hard to go back and sleep you know it's very hard to close them again and um uh, pass it off you know and while I, while I got involved in the uh, pro-choice movement and the same-sex marriage uh, movement I also got involved in the in the homeless um uh, campaign as well raising the roof uh, in a parlor house and I'm very passionate around equality for people living in direct provision because 
I'm not a Muslim woman. Or I never lived in direct provision or anything of the sort, and I don't pretend to. However, I think it's vitally important that, you know, that we have that solidarity when we know what it's like ourselves to live in bad accommodation. And it's 20 times worse for uh, people living in direct provision. So at the moment, I'm campaigning to end direct provision. And I can't understand why they're waiting for 20, uh, 2024 to do that, you know. And also, as well, around hate crime legislation, the reason why I um, tried to get the seat was to bring about a good hate crime legislation for for ethnic minority groups and it's a collective uh, action as well, the hate crime legislation would be. So Minister McAteen at a meeting just previously said that um, she's looking at that for the Easter time. So my job is to hold her to account and to have a look at that bill and see does it, does it, is it, is it an equal, a, a bill of equality and that people will be prosecuted for some of the bitter hate crimes that they, 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 they commit. And just to say like, why we open up our eyes to the inequalities. You can't open up your eyes to the inequalities and the pain sometimes people from ethnic minority groups and marginalised groups go through unless we get to know people from marginalised groups. I had great pleasure working with the uh, Amel's uh, women's group with um, the Muslim Sisters of Ere and to get to know people because even I when I was 18, 19, I was prejudiced, you know, and I think it's it's okay to to, to to be prejudiced but not act out in your prejudices and again I just I have such a passion for it but I will say and I know we're probably moving on to it later it's very challenging right now I'm really really burnt out and it's a lovely day today International Women's Day and I think International Women's Day should include us all as women you know that it's not only for women uh, from upper class um, and has a, that has a load of money and stuff and sometimes you know like for me I don't want to take anything off upper class women you know and uh, what I want upper class women to do is give women like us a hand up you know and to make sure that um, women from ethnic minority groups and marginalized groups are, are has an equal voice around the political table um, in, in the Iraqis and in uh, at our big decision policy making uh, decisions as well. So yeah, yeah, and, and again, like just I, I leave uh, Claire come in now, but there's so much inequalities that, that traveler women still go through today. Like I know Claire, you're gonna speak about the mother and baby home um, it's still a shame within my community for a woman to have a child before marriage, you know, and all, all this all needs to be explored when we talk about women's equality and like, you know, we have to think about the women that we're leaving behind as well. So I, I just want to end on that note and uh, thanks so much for having me here today. Thanks a million, Eileen. Um, Claire, Eileen said something there about when you open your eyes to injustice, you can't just close them again. You can't forget what you've seen. Um, and, you know, sometimes we think of solicitors um, and barristers who work in the human rights field as, you know, it's a job, but it's not. It becomes more than that. So so what is it that made you an activist? What drove you to pursuing human rights law as your, you know, as your vocation? Well, first of all, happy International Women's Day, and I want to thank you all for the invite to join you today. Um, I'm really delighted to take part in this inaugural event of Women in Media Belfast, and I'm really humbled to be in the company of such talented women who share the same goals as me of promoting uh, the rights of other women and highlighting their talents. So uh, thank you very much. I think the stories today um, that I've heard from, from uh, the people surrounding me at the moment and so many others are inspirational um, in the same way as the, the people I work with every day and have the real privilege to act for. Um, I'm really fortunate that I, I'm in the position where I have a chance to try and, and help um, promote rights and any sense of injustice um, that, that people should come to me with, great or small, every day in my work. And, um, what what drew, what drew me to that work? Well, I, I've been a lawyer for eleven years. Um, I I've worked um, I've worked in in human rights really since the outset. I started out doing civil actions about historical institutional abuse. Uh, recently, we set up Phoenix um, with with my partners um, Peter Corrigan, Dara Macken, and Kieran Moyna. 
Um, and our firm is committed to promoting equality, access to justice and, and visibility of the two, because we're of the view that um, there's no point in having these rights if no one knows they're entitled to them um, and can reach out and get them. Um, I've been working on various different campaigns um, and, and cases um, and through social media campaigns, we can ensure that citizens know, um, know the rights that they're entitled to and, and reach out. Um, equality between men and women is enshrined in Article 23 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights and it's non-negotiable, but you only have to look at even the campaign work that we had to take part in during the pandemic. Um, and you'll see that um, even then, um, it, it became more essential to highlight that the real issues facing women, domestic and, and gender uh, based violence increased and unemployment of women dropped significantly. So many women's roles are regressing to the 1950s model um, and we have to ensure that that's reversed. Um, it's so important. Um, during during the, um, the pandemic, I also took part with, with other um, journalists and, and lawyers um, in and what I, I look at as a twin track approach to trying to advance rights um, using the law um, together with, um, with politics and together with media to ensure that awareness is raised and that people know um, that there is injustice and that they're entitled to have it dealt with. Um, uh, for example, the, the doctors at the front line had insufficient PPE and in conjunction with legal proceedings that I initiated, um, together with the strategy to inform uh, the public through media, um, real real difference was managed to be achieved there. And, and uh, um, similarly, the, the campaign for JR80, which was the redress for survivors and victims of institutional abuse is one that was that had various different streams of, of strategy through, through legal and media and politics. And that went on for many years. And that was a case to challenge the failure to implement a redress scheme for survivors of abuse following the HIA inquiry in line with its recommendation to compensate um, victims. It, it's difficult to imagine how they should actually have to be reaching out and asking for it, having went through the harrowing testimony before a public inquiry, having to relive all that childhood trauma and then wait for the three years and really, really difficult um, legal campaign uh, to, to ask just that, what they're entitled to. Um, and um, it took two levels of court hearing, um, the High Court and then the Court of Appeal, together with um, you know, phenomenal campaign work by the likes of Margaret McGuggan of Savia, mm -hmm. um, using the campaign, uh, every weapon in her armory um, to challenge politicians and, and government um, in, in the political and, and media front. So um, through lobbying ministers and uh, taking part in TV debates. Um, meanwhile, uh, uh, the Court of Appeal uh, hearing the evidence. Um, and, and those are people who were attacked by others in the course of that um, campaign also. And I know we're going to get to that. Um, but I suppose I feel strongly that um, the, I get to, to have the real privilege of working with people who who have really, as a last resort, come to me because they feel that um, no one's listening. Um, and through a, a strategy before the court, and usually along with the campaign group, for example, Action for Muckamore, um, we have managed to use the law um, together with not shutting up, because that's what, that's what we're expected to do, to keep quiet and, and to be silenced. Um, but but our strategy is always to speak up and, and to use every weapon we can to ensure um, that that um, that the uh, the most vulnerable are protected and and that their voices are raised. Um, so, you know what's remarkable listening to you all is that whilst you all have worked on campaigns um, that are important and that are very close to your own heart for whatever reasons. Um, you all come across to me saying, ah, oh, yeah, but you know, there's always somebody worse off and I have a duty to help them as well. And I think that that's quite a remarkable feature of female activism. And I wanted to ask you, Eileen, um, you know, all of your years and the campaigns that you've been involved in, 
Um, so you've you've gone from being a community activist and now you're a legislator, you're now in the Shannon. Um, is it a case of poacher turned gamekeeper and how do you continue to be an activist when you're in the Oireachtas? Do you find yourself sometimes getting sucked in by the rules and the procedure of the place and does that impact on your activism? No, actually I don't. If anything, um, you know, today's theme of International Women's Day is choose, is choose uh, to challenge. And, you know, a few weeks ago when I was in the Iraq, as I wore my uh, N-Direct Vision hoodie, while I was speaking about agriculture and um, speaking about uh, the digital divide of, of young people. And Mark Daly approached me like last week and said to me, uh, you shouldn't wear in your, because anyone then can wear tops. And he said it in a lovely way and I understood it. But again, it's really about, oh, sure, I, sorry, I just didn't understand. I'd better get a slap in the hand afterwards for doing something wrong than uh, not doing it. And again, you have to- yeah, be It's better to it. ask for forgiveness than permission yeah. sometimes, isn't yeah. it? And that's the kind of way I'm, I'm, I've, I've approached it. And it's really about not changing. You know, I love me hoodies. I love me baggy trousers, me tracksuit buttons. And, you know, it's really about like going in there. Like my, my, my twin sister would say to me, Jesus Island, would you not put down a nice blazer or something? And I'd say no, because it's not about the clothes that I wear. Like I like being comfortable while being, but as well as that, like it's not to forget. And that's why I keep running up that I'm born and reared in Labrie Park, which is a hot and sight, you know, and the lived experience and you know they 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 try to change your language in a sense with the policies and reading them out and stuff but i it could take me three hours to turn something into my own language you know when i get up and speak and stuff and it's really important that you remain who you are because there's too many fake uh, uh, people in the world you know and mm -hmm. like if you're going to be a senator that speaks or tries to give advice to, like i can't and this is something that like I really want people to know that I'm not the vice for everybody, you know, I, I'm the vice that of the inequalities that I see with trying to bring people from ethnic minority groups and just keep highlighting ethnic minority groups and to work with uh, people like, you know, and I think it's critically important that we work with communities and groups. Again, there's nothing about us without us. Like, I don't like to get up and say, well, today I'm speaking in behalf of uh, Muslim women when I'm not a Muslim woman, where I, I don't, the best thing I can do is go to Muslim women and get a statement off them and read it out because it's their advice and not mine, you know. And again, it's really about not losing that. Like sometimes a man once said to me here a few weeks ago, you keep playing the one tune, I leave. <laughs> and what he meant by that is I keep talking about uh, black people and traveler people and Muslim people and people in homeless, uh, sit a bad situation, living in poverty really in Ireland and poverty exists in Ireland, you know? And that's what he meant, like I shouldn't be speaking, I should be up and speaking about agriculture more importantly than, than people, you know? And, and, and for me, it's about keep playing that record because that's what got me in there. And that record is something that needs to keep playing until it's listened to, so yeah. And can just just to follow up on that, um, how important has it been to you in your role as a senator, the support of other women legislators? Because I know that there's some amazing other uh, some other amazing senators in there, like Lynn Ruan, um, Senator Francis Black, women like that who've who've maybe had a little bit more experience in that role than you and. Has it made a difference to you? And that's something that we're trying to do in women in media. And that's why I'm asking, you know, has the support of pe people around you, of women around you, been a benefit to you in the role? Yeah, I am. Um, I'm in a group called the Civil Engagement Group. And there's, we're the only group in the Iraq that's a group of women. And there's four of us, Alice Mary Higgins, Lynn Yuan and Francis Black. Uh, and, you know, I went in there hitting the uh, ground running because we we I lived in I lived in the situations I know what it's like to be the ordinary person to have to sneak in Anna Lewis uh, to get to education every day and not having the money to pay Anna Lewis or not having the money for the cup of tea or like you know really starving going to Trinity College how the hell could you be successful when you have to live in those kind of situations and I know that. I, I know there's many young people today still living in those situations, you know, and basically like 
I, I always say that you can't get, like, you know, my mother used to say, a lie can get you home. And all I do in there is just speak the truth and speak as much as I can and bring other women with me. Because I think it's so important, especially for women from ethnic minority groups, you know, not only are we women, but we're women who are traveler women, Muslim women, black women, uh, poor women. And again, it, we're not just like, you know, we experience um, internalized oppression and externalized oppression. And that's something that we don't openly speak about, you know, and, and, and that can be very tough in social media as well, because as I always say, there's no right way to be a traveler uh, woman, you know, and sometimes you see men within my community that speaks about the real traveler woman and to make me be less of a traveler woman when I was born and reared as a traveler, and I am a traveler woman, you know, so, at, at, at the moment, if I'm honest, uh, which I am, I'm really burnt out with social media, with media, uh, uh, with it, like, you know, you feel that level of responsibility of 40,000 people on your shoulders and, you know, you, you're in there to, to make a difference. And if you could make one, uh, like, I'm only looking to change one piece of legislation and that there's the hate crime legislation and to end direct provision and to help other legislations for the traveller community, like the mental health uh, strategy and, um you know, so that's my main focus. But I will say that women, women in media and women in these, in 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 this, especially women from ethnic minority groups, and it's not about feeling sorry for ourselves because we all want to be in these roles, you know. But it is really, really tough, and we have to acknowledge that toughness because cultural barriers as well. Like, and that's something we don't really speak about. I'm sure, uh, Padma, you could relate to the cultural barriers that, that comes with being a, a Muslim, an openly speaking Muslim woman as well around the inequalities. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, Eileen, just before I move on to ask, to Fad ask Fatima a question, you said you feel you have the, the responsibilities of 40,000 women upon your shoulders, but I think what's important on International Women's Day is that we remember the hundreds and the tens and hundreds of thousands of women that are there to hold you up, you know, mm. and the women that are rooting for you and supporting you. And mm. Fatima, I want to go in and ask you a question now um, about your own journey. And one of the most striking elements of it for me, um, you know, the journey that you and your family have been on um, and the part that many people have lost sight of is that you and two of your sisters were in prison as you referred to. Uh, for four months, but the Jew as a filmmaker were documenting the protests in Egypt at the time of your arrest. And do you feel that some of your own identity was lost or diminished because, you know, that was forgotten about and the campaign then, the focus then switched to um, the campaign to free your brother? Um, I think um, that's actually a really important question and it's something that's not really actually lost in the, in the campaign in and of itself. Um, but I definitely agree with you 100% um, throughout the campaign, or even if it's not just me, and I'm pretty sure like my, my sisters as well would, were probably, they, they all had their own journey as well um, and what they had to deal with, but coming forward or, you know, um, kind of like refocusing our, or reshifting our whole entire um, uh, experience to this kind of element of just how do we free Ibrahim? That became our main focus. Uh, whether it was through my my older sisters, my younger sister, my man, Samaya, who was kind of like leading head on. And then also my other sister, Khadija and Naseba, you know, who were just, it was just an experience that we all kind of like, they had to sometimes with their own marriages and their own children kind of like, you know, at one point, one of my sisters, one of my sisters were leaving and then they'd have to leave their children behind with us so they can go out over there to Egypt and kind of like be with Ibrahim. Um, and the other thing that was kind of like lost in between that was not just, it was not just about our experience, it was not just around, you know, our identity, but equally as well, when we went onto the social media, it was just about, we had to prove our innocence before even having to like, prove or like speak up about this is an injustice that has just happened to a minor. Um, and putting that aside and putting everything that has happened, um, that had been quite difficult to identify, like to really push forward or really try and understand because mm -hmm. you're dealing with a trauma that you've just, you've just endured. Mm -hmm. um, you're also dealing with like, where do I stand in all of this and where, how can I move forward with all of this? My own mental health kind of like was really, um, was really damaged or kind of like really suffered during that time. And then equally as well, there wasn't a way of me showing that or being able to equ express that 
just due to the fact of the pressure that was coming through, whether it was from the social media, whether it was from the you know mainstream media and having to constantly, one of the things that we were constantly always asked about was why you were there. It wasn't a matter of, okay, guys, this was an injustice that just happened. You know, we did something good. And for a while as well, I had to question myself and be like, did what I do, was it sufficient? Was it right? Like I had to question that. And it was, it's a really kind of like insecurity that you deal with. And um, internally, you're kind of like having this internal battle. And exactly what I mean, I mean, said, you go in and you're like, you're suffering and you have an internal struggle. And, you know, as you're on media and as a, as a person who was on media, I was not, um, I never imagined myself to be at the forefront of it. I think I would always imagine myself to be behind the cameras, be, be, be the one creating the content and not having to put out the content. So that was an, an entire new experience for all of us. Um, but definitely, definitely one of the things that I'm always very lucky to, to feel is the privilege um, of having the support of my own sisters and my own family and my own mother and my parents um, and equally as well with my friends and just really kind of like getting around people who are females and especially like even being in this space and remembering even within my own colleagues and you know within the space of my work with as a filmmaker is just remembering um, the importance of why and the importance of our voices because once you have a voice or once you know your voice exists, it's really difficult to step back and be like, yeah, okay, I can, I can shut it up now. Um, that's, that's not possible. Yeah, and it's, um, as Eileen was referring to earlier about, you know, when she was younger and being treated with suspicion when she would go into shops, and you referred to, you know, the first instance having to prove your innocence before anybody would take on to support you. Um, and this seems to be a common thread for people from minority groups, and particularly women from minority groups in Ireland. And I'm struck by something that um, I heard Abraham say on a podcast I listened to on News Talk a few weeks back about how it's important to separate nationality and religion and ethnicity, that first and foremost, he believes um, that the issue to tackling um, discrimination and hate crime and, and um, ill treatment of minority groups is to recognize individuals as Irish first and foremost. And I'm wondering how, how do you affect that change? You know, what's, what are the challenges to affecting that change? Well, um, I think, let's be real here, there's a lot of challenges that occur throughout um, and there are still challenges that um, you may you may think that you've kind of grasped your head around and, you know, being able to move forward with it. Um, one of the biggest challenges I feel, even as an individual, whether it's internally, is actually um, being okay in your identity. Like, it took me a while to say and feel like Eileen mentioned is, I am a Muslim woman. I am Irish, whether people like it or not, and I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna step down of that. I come also from an Egyptian background, and I'm very proud of that. And I'm proud of the identities that I hold and being very secure in those. That kind of like that is an internal thing that you need to also start feeling first. That's a challenge internally, and once you hit that challenge, um, that's something that you you begin then to be able to. To move forward and face the external challenges that are happening and through facing those external challenges is continue being in those spaces and advocating or lobbying or speaking up and not kind of like stepping down or feeling shame in what you're doing because a lot of the times there's external pressure um, that you can feel or an external pressure that's coming around like a lot of the times we were questioned about as a muslim woman all these oppression that have happened and it's it's very insane like even when i come to here it's like you know aren't you isn't doesn't islam oppress women and like three of us were like you know my sisters my two sisters and i and my sisters behind the scene we were leading this campaign and it was like the rhetoric was saying or the messages were being different but people were still questioning it and it was like are you guys aware of what you're saying um and i think the main thing is not to feel uh, firstly not to feel sorry for ourselves and to continue to push through whatever challenges is being in spaces that we're not welcomed in and challenging those spaces as well and not having um i think it takes a little bit of kind of like um feeling stable within yourself to come out and say actually i don't feel comfortable with what you just did whether it's with one person or whether it's in a work environment um and just getting out there like you know even as a filmmaker there's not many muslim filmmakers out there and it's kind of lovely to see that you know 
a lot of Muslim females are coming out there and beginning to speak up and kind of like having a voice. And that's a challenge in of itself. You're, you're breaking that stereotype. You're breaking that and feeling comfortable to be in those spaces and not having to worry and being like, you know, you do get a lot as a female, I think, I suppose even you have a lot of imposter syndrome that happens that occurs internally, but like you need to tackle those and you need to be able to say, actually, I am comfortable in my own skin. I'm comfortable with saying I am Irish, regardless of what other people think I am. Um, and then being able to tackle, actually, even like the concept of like hate crime, it's really important. Um, I've been a victim before of kind of like, you know, whether it's hate crimes or like abuse and uh, external abuse outside. And I couldn't, I wasn't able to report that. Or even when I did, there was no follow up on that. And how do you ensure that there is? Because a lot of other minority individuals are happening that are, are this is happening to them. And I think one last point is equally as well is like how do we connect together or how do we um work together and collaborate together because that's really important like we all um i think that was mentioned through claire and eileen like we all have our own passion for you know elements that we want to speak up about and things that we feel very passionate about but i think in collaborating and coming together even in this string event that breaks that challenge and begins to allow people to start um, breaking their own kind of like um, external uh, prejudice that they may have or biases that they may have. Mm -hmm. And Claire, just picking up on some of the threads there about, um, you know, how people are perceived and perceptions, you've represented clients in significant human rights cases, legacy inquests, victims of historical institutional abuse, victims of paedophile priests. Have you found that the response to those campaigns on social media or generally has been different? Are there some causes that are seen as more worthy than others? And how does that impact on your clients? Well, I know, I suppose any any of the, the causes that, that we're working with generally from day to day, um, you know, it's difficult to deny that, you know, patients families of Muckamore don't deserve a public inquiry. It's difficult to deny that survivors of abuse don't deserve their compensation. Um, when these matters are raised publicly, the, the, um, you know, the feedback is predominantly overwhelmingly good, but I have been involved in campaigns such as the, the for example, the survivors of abuse where, you know, those at the heart of the campaign, the, the campaign are women, um, Margaret McGuggan, for example. Um, and I'm aware that that she was subject um, to serious attacks by others. Um, she suffered trolling, abuse, and at one point she even considered stepping down from the, the campaign. And it, it came on to me also. Um, I had to report um, online bullying and trolling to the police at that point. Um, and I'm not aware of any others, um, you know, who, who had that kind of onslaught that, you know, similarly to Margaret. And it's very clear that uh, she was subjected to a relentless online bullying uh, campaign, which was an attempt to silence her. Um, hard to know how much of that's down to her gender, uh, but I didn't witness other male campaigners suffer what she did. Um, mm -hmm. Women in, in public life just face a regular onslaught of abuse. Uh, particularly from online trolls, usually faceless cowards with fake names. Um, and in fact, this is one of the, the main reasons that women are often fearful to speak out because it requires courage, huge courage. I mean, when I listen to Fatima and Eileen here, um, you know, and particularly in circumstances where you, in, in the case of mine, you know, we're, we're victims have to repeat over and over terrible crimes which have been done to them. Um, and, and then to face that kind of trolling and abuse all I, the only thing I can offer is to constantly uh, keep going, push it forward and, and it appears we'll be continuing to do it. Like Eileen says, the mother and baby home scandal here in the north, um, uh, it, it didn't stop at the border. Um, clearly those women and their babies here in the north are now going to have to campaign for their uh, public inquiry, it hasn't just been um, it hasn't just been agreed to, and 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 so it all begins again. Um, uh, but but yes, um, the the issues that we deal with, you know, you you can't it, when when it's raised, you know, n no minister is going to say that well, you know, we don't care about mother and baby or we don't care about um, Muckamore. But why does it take a campaign group to have to reach these people to do the right thing? And, and that's what we try and, and assist with. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and and Eileen Fatima's talked a little bit about the the types of of trolling and abusive comments that she's had and her family in the campaign had during um, the, their campaign for Abraham's release on social media. Can you tell me a little bit about your experiences of social media and how you've dealt with it? Hmm. Yeah, I've uh, got everything from abusive uh, photos to uh, I'll hate messages like I'm only a, I'm only an actor, you know, and I'm never going to be anything else. And then I most previous one that I got, actually the most up to date one that I got was, you know, somebody from the far right movement admires my work, but doesn't admire that I uh, that I that I want uh, equality for all and for black people. And, you know, and I found I find them very hard messages. Now, what I do do is I mute the messages. And then sometimes if I know it's a man and it's a little bit, I will probably reply and say, fuck off. And you know, and I know maybe I like, and that's what in public life, like sometimes where you just want to tell them to f off or mind their business if they're not doing it. You know that they should just paddle along themselves. But um, that's where public life gets me because I would be feisty and I would be that person that would say, you know, something actually you don't have a right to say that about uh, uh, black people or about uh, traveller people or about Muslim people. And I would like, you know, but it's not about shutting people down. Sometimes you get so annoyed that you first thing that comes to your head is I'm not going to even feed into this. And it's a man again that's given out of, to me about what I do and stuff. And sometimes you do react, you know, and I, I've never got media training, like never in my life have I got media training. And I will say sometimes, sometimes I have to say the social media, like I'm at the point where I absolutely really dislike social media. I would use the word hate only that it's such a strong word to use. I like you know you've got so much trolls in social media and then like you're doing so much work in the ground and everybody wants to stand in solidarity with the the marginalized communities and stuff but when push comes to shove and when it's been on the streets you know I I don't see that very visible so while social media plays a good role in in society it can also play a very negative uh, role as well and you know it can be mentally draining, not for me personally as a as 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 an individual, but also um, for uh, like you know I see brilliant traveller activists like you know there's always um, there's always something to be dealt with you know there's always racism online there's always and I find that mentally draining, um, and 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 sometimes it's 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 okay to take a little step back you know. And I, I don't know, maybe it's just my hormones are a little bit all over the place right now. I haven't got to, but I, I find it extremely um, tough at present because, you know, there's so much racism online, like racism now you can actually, you're not, you're not even safe in your own home. You know, you're not even safe in your own home if you log on to social media and see the, 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 now it's not every day either. And I think Fatima is right, like, you know, that it's not about feeling sorry for ourselves. And I don't want this to be looking as if you're feeling, I'm feeling sorry for myself. It's about really highlighting the, the issues that goes out, that go on online, you know. And for me, the majority of people have been men, you know, that kind of way. Now, unless they're fake accounts and women, I, I, I don't know, but the majority had been male names and, and I'm presuming they're male names. But I will say, like, you know, we are allowed to be individuals within our own right. We're not just black women. We're not just Muslim women. We're not just traveller women. We are women who also has has a potential to reach in our life and has goals in our life for ourselves and for our children as well, you know. And I think it's really important to never see a woman our person from an ethnic minority group as a just, you know, because uh, that there uh, disempowers the person to go on and be and reach their own uh, full potential. But social media can be poisoning sometimes, while it can actually work in the best uh, the best way possible. Like it's great for campaigns, it's great to get a conversation going, but also again when we talk about mental health and talk about inequalities like you know you can actually experience it within your own home that safe space that we all had is no longer even our safe spaces anymore so and I, I find it's not that um, women as well especially women from ethnic minority groups you know the old 
and sometimes you just want to tell them to F off, you know, and just be yourself as well as what you would told them this time last year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> just to pick up on that, Claire, um, Eileen has said that social media is great for getting campaigns going. And um, but what do you do with it then? I mean, it's is, is it a case that the, the, the mute and the block button are your friend? Well, I mean, I have to 100% agree with an awful lot of what Eileen's just said there, you know, it really rings true. I mean, even when when this event went out publicly and, and then, you know, some negative comments were coming back, um, you know, it, it's it, it is it, and actually, you know, it can it, it can really affect um, not only, you know, people like, um, you know, yourselves who are constantly raising issues. But the fact is, most of the main big campaigns and um, well, that I'm aware of here are spearheaded by women. Um, you know, we look at BLM, we look at the mother and baby, we look at, um, you know, the, uh, the Savia campaign and, and so many others. There are men, out, or there are women out there, you know, putting, putting their almost their necks on the line because really once the campaign goes public, you know, that so does the onslaught of abuse. Um, and, you know, I've, I've had uh, instructions to, uh, to have to, um, for example, uh, injunct um, uh, articles which were due to be printed about clients in newspapers, which were not um, fact checked, not correct, uh, which would have caused terrible detriment to their mental health had they went out, um, you know, survivors of abuse. Um, so yeah, it, it often it does become very, very daunting for people. Um, I, I think social media has has so many plus points, but you know, um, it, it, it certainly has um, a real uh, impact on on people's well being and mental health. And we have to be careful with uh, with well being and in, in these situations as well. So I mean, I couldn't couldn't agree with Eileen enough there. Um, Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I'm sure you just want to switch off completely at times and you're only out there doing you know raising the voice of others and um you know often doing the government's job for them but then you face the attacks so yeah final question of the the panel for Fatima um what is your call to action what do you say to people who are involved in campaigning on rights issues and how um how can they ensure that they use the tools at their disposal um, for the best effect, the social media tools at their disposal for the best effect. Um, I think I just want to echo what Eileen and also Claire said, just in relation to kind of like how difficult that space online can be. And especially if you are personally being attacked for something that you feel for, or you know, you think you're doing a good cause, and ultimately at the end of the day, that's being a personal attack on you and kind of like your own beliefs and your own system. And 100 um, percent, it's um, just in terms of like what Eileen said about. So it's not about actually just feeling sorry for ourselves, but it also it's about telling our truth. So I wasn't saying in relation to, oh, we need to we can't feel sorry for ourselves, but we need to also portray the truth of what's happening and how we're feeling. If we're feeling exhausted or we're feeling burnt out, we need to be able to say that and be able to express because it's difficult spaces that we are in. Um, but I think on the call of action and one thing, something that kind of came through from our campaign and something that I've kind of um, learned along the way, because along the way, um, I had to take time off social media. I was uh, was negatively impacting me on the mental health. I, I, I kind of couldn't comprehend how people I thought were from my own country, from my own, uh, you know, that they should they should understand this was where I was being an attack point uh, for that. And I think one of the things, and even I know um, my sisters who are following or watching today and, and kind of speaking to them before that, um, and especially Samaya, one of the things that kind of came through is, you know, first, uh, have a good support network. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be, um, it's, it's going to be one hell of a road. Um, and having that network and having those support individuals to support you. You know, we were, I was able to lean on my sisters. They were able to lean on me at times. We had different roles to play. Um, at times I was doing something, Samaya was doing another thing and dividing those roles and being aware of those roles. Understanding that social media cannot be that be all and end all. Um, it was a really good starting point for us. It got like, um, and Samaya described this so beautifully when I was having a conversation with her just prior to this she said it's like you know everything that we did was kind of like a chain we were kind of like putting a chain together and then social media was almost like um 
you know, the, the I don't know, like the, the point at the end where it clicked everything together and kind of got that chain together. You know, we did a lot of um, lobbying. We got so many, you know, whether w one of the things that kind of like really helped push the campaign uh, was in relation to like Lynn Boylan kind of coming on. And then we had Dara as well, who became our, uh, our lawyer for pro bono. And then we had like different organizations like Amnesty, Uplift and Reprieve kind of coming on. And at the end of the day, like people were just kind of like supporting. So as much as there is negativity online, and you know as much as there is it's really difficult to maneuver that space as much as sometimes you need to be able to switch that off and being a woman being um a female we were quite young I was only like 23 when we first got into this campaign and it was like whoa I, I was beginning to get you know face the world and go into the big bad world of um, employment and what I ended up having to do was go into the big bad world of online advocacy um campaigning and I was like what is happening like this is a lot to maneuver for someone who was at that young age and just mm -hmm. understanding that sometimes getting people to do things can be effective so instead of asking them to just like the page or you know asking them having a call of action that really helps so when we would be like you know um guys can you please message your tds or have a sample letter for them that was really impactful as well like we asked people at one point um uh, you know to write letters to Ibrahim and that was really supportive and that allowed him to really kind of like boost his uh, morale in that way because at a very time it was very bleak and uh, very dark in that sense and equally as well remember I don't know for me what was really um really important at one point was my faith and like having that spirituality and that connection and understanding that there's a bigger purpose and there's a bigger reason and when you put that forward um being able to see that bigger picture knowing that there's light at the end of the tunnel no, no, at the end of the tunnel you know our ancestors paved the way for us now and that's what we're doing for the future generations to come and that's really really important to continue remembering but equally as well to not forget ourselves because sometimes as you know as campaigners as advocators as we can sometimes as females as well we tend to forget and focus and you know keep giving ourselves that love and that passion as we give to others and it's important to remember that like you know along the way I need a therapy and I'm not shy or I'm not going to be shying away from saying that and that is okay for us to say and for us to call out and be like that's what I need I need time off social media I still do this to this day I switch off and I'm like I can't deal with this this is too much I need my own space I need to reconnect with me as well at the same time um, and just giving yourself that love and that compa compassion as you give to others or as you are giving to those causes I think that's really important as well um, yeah so those are kind of like a few things that I probably say as a call of action to continuously remember it's not an easy road and it wasn't meant to be but at the end of the day even if we don't see you know the success here it will create success for the future generations to come and I think that's one of the things that I continuously remember as a or try and put in mind is what I'm doing may not impact me now but it will definitely impact the next generations of Muslim females or you know young Muslims or people of ethnic minorities or people of color or black people and that's important what am I doing now I may not see that now but I will I'm hope I'm hoping as I'm hoping to see it in the future so yeah mm -hmm. Eileen, what advice would you give to other women? Um, my advice is, you know, to keep it's it's great. Choose your battles, you know, and that you can't fight every battle by yourself. And sometimes we use the term fight, fight, fight. And again, it's actually like choose to challenge, you know. And when you're choosing to challenge the team of today, choose the challenge that you know that you like, you know, you need people with you as well. Like it's not something that you can do by your um, by yourself. And I'm I'm very lucky to have uh, Corey White to manage my Twitter account and stuff, which I'm not really on at all of the time because I'm a um, I'm actually early pregnant again and it's very oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah yeah I'm, I'm only nine weeks so uh, I, I for the last few weeks it's been really um really tough on social media and stuff so I think that's where my emotions is is coming in and getting that time for yourself but there's one thing that I will say to um to women that's looking for equality and women who are fighting and in in the challenge to challenge equality is that we have to remember that it can't be equality for one set of women. It needs to be equality for all women, no matter our backgrounds. And to like, you know, we are different and let's celebrate those differences. And, 
you know, we may be me and my twin sister are not even two of the same people, although we're twins, you know, like I have um, a bent elbow, she has two straight elbows. And what I mean by that is I have very little movement in my left arm. And, you know, that makes us different and to embrace each other's difference and to know that we have equal, we're equal value to the world, you know. And just to say that, like, it's important that we stand up for each other and it's important that we stand up for inequalities that each other uh, go through because I don't believe that I can just get equality for the traveller community and I also want equality for trans women, for migrant mm -hmm. women, for women who did um, have to suffer through in the hands of the mother and baby homes, you know, and, and I really think that like to achieve equality we have to really want equality for for all and same for me around the um the the pro-choice campaign was I wasn't thinking about myself as a woman I was thinking about women within my community and other ethnic minority women especially that had an awful lot of cultural barriers to overcome and like you know abortion would have been one of those uh, cultural uh, barriers that like you know it's against the uh, um, people's values to to have abortions, but I know many a traveller women that that did have abortions, and it's important that you know we talk up for for those women who 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 are very nervous and afraid to speak up for themselves, and sometimes to be mindful that we can't we're not the advice of those women that we have to bring those women with us and get their voices heard. That's very important. So uh, and again, happy International Women's Day! Thanks for having me here today. So I very much appreciate. Thank you so much, Aileen. And I also want to say thank you to Claire and to Fatima for your contributions. I think this has been a really fascinating debate for me, especially as someone who has um, who's tried to be an activist, but also sees the strength of, of the women around me and takes inspiration for, from them. So I'll say to you, can you just continue to be in spaces where you're not welcome continue to put yourselves out there and continue to be activists for all that you believe in and thank you so much for taking part in the panel today